Thank you all so for having me. Verified air here. Oh, this is nice. Oh, yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Ah. Well, uh, nice to visit the rich relations. Yeah. <laughs> Have all the gadgets. Welcome. So, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so, let, let me just start with why we took up this bill, why it became uh, an immediate priority for the Senate. Can you just introduce yourself? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Phil Baruth, um, Senator from Chittenden County, currently Chair of Senate Education. Um, so, as you've no doubt heard or um, read about, there was a pilot conducted last September the pilot came back with results that, um, however you look at them, they are not, um, they're not results that you can walk away from. And looked at in one way, they're alarming. So all of those 16 schools had taps that were at levels of concern. So um, I apologize. Senator Kennedy. <laughs> I actually was standing in House Ag for a moment, I thought, oh. huh, didn't this committee used to be over there? <laughs> no. <laughs> Stacy. We, we would up, we would up there. <laughs> Governor Campion and I are <laughs> happy to be here. So, uh, so, as I say, those 16 uh, pilot uh, schools had taps that were at levels of concern. So. A uh, number of members of the Senate, including Senator Campion, uh, President Pro Tem, Chair of House Appropriations, and myself met to figure out not just a strategy for dealing with it, but an immediate strategy. And I stress that because I will, I will finish by reaffirming the Senate's <coughs> commitment to do this quickly. Um, that is via the budget adjustment at, at the levels um, that the Senate voted out. So. Um, what this does, in effect, is introduce two regimes. One is immediate and is directed by the Department of Health under guidelines that they will put together that are meant to be no less stringent than the 3T guidelines that the EPA um, puts out on a yearly basis. That process is uh, temporary and it's meant to get us through testing every school, independent school and uh, child care facility, licensed child care facility in one year. And so that testing will then immediately produce remediation required by law and under the Senate's vision the testing is covered and a certain percentage of the remediation costs are also covered. It sets uh, what is not the strictest um, parts per billion standard in the country but among them three parts per billion. Um, my committee had a great deal of testimony and a great deal of discussion about that parts per billion. There were members of my committee who wanted to go to one, which is closer to um, a scientific standard. The, the, um, the uh, pediatric associations recommend zero because any amount is considered unsafe. With that said, my committee did not believe one was an achievable standard um, or reliably achievable. The standard um, for bottled water, filtered bottled water that you buy in a store, that can vary up to five. Mm. And so we went between the three numbers, one, three, five, for several weeks, and we took additional testimony. We settled on three. I think that is a, an achievable number. It's a practical number, ultimately, but it is also um, a huge gain for the state of Vermont in terms of the health and safety of what we provide for our kids in schools. So the second regime that I mentioned is envisioned going forward. The Department of Health will do rulemaking under the you know, time-honored process with lots of testimony. It specifically requires ongoing consultation with uh, education and natural resources agencies so that there's input from uh, different stakeholder groups in the administration, but the Department of Health would be taking the lead. And those rules would be generated. They also would not be allowed to fall beneath the stringency standards of the three Ts um, put out by the EPA. So um, that's 
that's the heart of what we're doing. And just to return to the question of, of how the legislature responds to this, um, I just spoke with the chair of appropriations. She is committed to having the full funding in the budget adjustment uh, that we put in. I understand there's um, some concern, perhaps, about whether or not the committee would be finished with its policy deliberations before that budget adjustment goes through. I, I think that the feeling on the part of the Senate is that the money should be in the bus budget adjustment, uh, and we will push to make sure that that's the case, and then the, the policy-making work of this committee could extend beyond that once the money is safely there. Um, but I, I just want to remind everyone of something that's easy to forget, and that is the, the flood crisis. Um, that was obviously a much different situation, and it was much, uh, much more urgent, much more sensational. But the point is that um, we know now that there is lead in the schools and the child care centers of a certain amount. It is a neurotoxin that any amount can be damaging, and so I'm very proud that the Senate managed to move ahead in the way that they did, and it's my hope that the House will, um, will back us not only in what we do, but how fast we do. Senator Campion, maybe? No, I, I guess the only thing you may really cover, is Senator, is... For the record, Brian, could you... Uh, yeah, uh, Brian Campion, Bennington County, Wilmington. It was a little back and forth with the administration, around 15 parts per billion, and what we initially thought was one part per billion, I think three parts per billion, sounds like a great number. But I do understand that Representative Morrissey and others in... in and the House side have a bill for 15 parts per billion, and I would, I would just highly discourage you from going that high. I think where uh, Senate Ed Land is the right spot. It's a good compromise. And as Senator Bruce mentioned, the American Academy of Pediatrics, and I think most Americans realize no level of lead in water is good for children. <coughs> so that's all I've got. Did you hear from other states as to what their their requirements are? We, we didn't hear directly from uh, officials in other states, but we looked at uh, Jeff Francis. You can have him provide you with some information about what other states are doing. Um, I believe Illinois has a stricter level than uh, three parts per billion, and I believe Pennsylvania. District of Columbia had five parts per billion. But with three parts per billion, we would be probably in the top five in terms of strict standards in the country. Um, have you heard from the schools that they have actually remediated any of the schools? That, that we did. Um, we heard from the facilities manager of the Barry system, uh, and they were, it was either Montpelier or Barry, but it's on our witness list. But they were part of the pilot program, and we went over with them how they tested. Uh, one of the things we found out from him that was interesting to us, this bill requires testing and retesting, mandatory. Um, these pilots were voluntary, and retesting was voluntary post-remediation. So the schools that found that they had some levels of concern in various taps, they remediated, and then they did not test all of them afterwards, which seems to me, uh, you know, it's, it's an oversight that's hard to hard to um, argue for. So, um, but he, he was a very good witness in terms of telling us um, things about the cost, things about um, when they conducted the testing, because the bill requires that the testing be done during the school year rather than over the summer. And so he gave us great practical testimony. I can get you the, wit the witness list if you don't have it already. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, this question may have been asked. Um, the delivery system, water to our town or municipal water systems, who deliver the water to our schools, and, I mean, is there, who's to say that they're not delivering this water and what would be the, what would, what would be the ramification? They're, they're already tested. The, the delivery systems are currently tested. And so one of the reasons why we, um, why we didn't go to one is that we had information that, that the Montpelier water system varied so that it was sometimes over one. And so then the problem is 
if the water system is supplying a level over the actionable limit, then that school would have to install filters. And so that was the, the thing that ultimately killed the one part per billion, was that to reliably get there, you'd have to put many Vermont schools on a filter system. Those filters need to be changed out physically. I don't know what the frequency is, but certainly each year. So you're adding cost, you're, ask, you're adding physical <coughs> work time. So that's one of the reasons why we didn't go to one is the the municipal water source and what levels there were there. Do we do we want run the risk <clears throat> of uh, losing additional child care providers with with a bill like this? I don't In think so. Um, remediation. Um, or I, you know, the, the the Senate has imagined that our remediation would be substantial. Not wouldn't cover the whole cost, um, but testing would be free. And in the large percentage of cases, switching out a tap accomplishes the remediation. So, um, and child care centers, uh, you know, the home-based ones, I, I think, you know, could you, ha could you lose one over the fact that they are at four parts per billion and they need to get to three? I just have a hard time seeing that. But I'm sure you could get someone to say that any new regulation or any cost by the state will put them out of business the same way when we increase the minimum wage. You can get testimony where people will say, I'm going to have to shut my business down. If we, so if I may, I think what you might see is a shift of families taking their children out of certain <coughs> care centers and putting them in care centers that don't have lead in the water. I could see that kind of shift happening, absolutely. And we are. Yeah. We are. I mean, you see, you know, I don't know many parents that would want their children having, again, lead in drinking lead in water especially at that age early childhood where it could do detrimental damage uh, uh, so i think if there were a child care center where it were 10 parts per billion or something like that and, and the family and the people said no, we're not going to change it or we you know i think that it would then shift to other safer areas it's really a consumer protection bill in a lot of ways uh, perhaps i'm inferring incorrectly but when you talked about moving when um, Representative Cooley asked this question, and you said one wouldn't work because some municipal systems may be above that. Uh, am I inferring correctly that, that you're saying that no municipal systems go above three then? We didn't have testimony that there were any that did. Um, so if if you have a municipal system that has uh, more than that, I, I my feeling is we would be hearing alarm bells go off. So I. The number that was the highest for any we heard with municipal systems was three. And that wasn't, uh, it wasn't always three. It was, they had at one point reported up to three, but they tend below that. But they're required to be below 15 by EPA. Yes. Yeah, so so 15, um, and I might as well say this because we're, we're all family, education committees, and you will have the administration come in. And the administration was, as Senator Campy said, pushing for a 15 parts per billion standard. Um, I, I don't see how that's conscionable given the results of these tests myself. Um, we did give them something else that they badly wanted, which was Department of Health to be in charge of this operation. They have their own lab. They're either going to run all the tests or they're going to certify somebody to run some of them for them. So um, they were they were not, I wouldn't say, happy with the three parts per billion standard, but in the same way that the EPA has kept it high partially because of <coughs> the, the thinking about what it takes to bring it down. But to my mind, that's secondary to the fact that this is a, a neurotoxin that is particularly directed at developing brains. And um, so one last thing I wanted to make sure I get on the record. Um, the bill that came to us from Senator Campion, um, I don't believe originally included child care. So maybe it did. Um, but we, we made the decision to continue um, child care facilities in the bill, and that added expense. It was about 25% of, of the expense is child care facilities. But we were presented with the contradiction in our own logic 
if we were saying it was unconscionable to have public schools and independent schools educating children, how could you have the state be in charge of <coughs> licensed childcare facilities but not regulate their lead levels? And if you're going to regulate their lead levels in this sense, aren't you also committed to paying for it? So that's what we've done, and I think that's logically consistent, but it's also, um, you know, it's just in human terms what we should be doing. So it isn't just identifying those that, that are pre-approved for pre-K. It's it's all, it's all, all approved child yes. care facilities. Licensed register. Okay. What is it? Private. <coughs> um, Church-run facilities. Licensed and registered. So, um, so the state already has that oversight role. Do you know what percent of schools have been tested so far? Uh, <coughs> have been, well, the bill covers this year. Yeah. So um, if you have been tested outside the last calendar year, I, I would have to believe there haven't been many other than the, the 16 that were in the pilot. I think when I read through this, it said that um, the actionable level of three parts per billion is on the first draw sample. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't allow, it, well, I'm just sort of picturing a small registered child care that may be home based, that doesn't allow them the option of uh, simply flushing. You well, you have, you have to do a second sample where you flush. Right. And, but, so again, I apologize, I don't have it understood this correctly. But if you have a first draw of three or above, you must remediate. Yes. So the second, the flush draw, if it's zero, it doesn't matter then. Well, and and there are we have testimony. There are districts right now where they instruct the custodial staff to flush the the water system, and that's simply not good enough, right? Because if it isn't flushed, if you know children go into the building and somebody hasn't done their job, then they're drinking. Uh, so having the lead level depend on a human being flushing every day is not going to work. Reminds me of uh, when I was on the school board in Burlington in Edmond School. There was a proposal to put in an elevator because disabled kids were not allowed to go to Edmonds. They were shipped out to the New North End um, because there was no elevator for them. Elevator was going to cost $1.8 million. And so there was this dispute about it. And a, a woman said um, at the public meeting, well, why couldn't some strong boys agree that they would carry the kid down in the event of a fire? Um, obviously, that's not how we want to set up our system. So similarly here, I, I wouldn't want to have it depend on um, flushing something that we know is We are aware that there is a pressure to move on this. I, I, uh, I appreciate the fact that you're having a hearing and, and moving forward on it. We are tomorrow, um, H3 comes to the floor, um, and we've done our work on that. We appreciated very much the unanimous vote you had out of the, out of the House. That was very helpful to me in making sure that people didn't change that bill. Because as you, as you well know, everybody wanted to change the bill one way or another. And I was able to keep saying the House achieved a unanimous vote. And on this particular issue, that's huge. So we're not, to the extent we can avoid it, we're not doing anything from that. So um, I think we've done well picking up each other's priorities. I think we have the AA on the floor tomorrow, so okay. that's a little bit of a challenge. But Representative Elder? Um, so the, the funding for testing, does that basically cover the actual cost of the testing um, with the health department? Yes. And does that include bottles or equipment necessary to collect samples? Yes. So, so the, they would um, provide um, vials or however they want to do it along with instructions to districts and and then any labor needed to uh, send notifications, uh, send this further information about what will be done depending on the result, and the actual testing, that's all going to be absorbed into local school budgets. 
Right. So, of the labor to do so the, the Department of Health gets funding to do their end of it, but you're right, local governments <coughs> would um, have a facilities <coughs> manager or a custodian actually filling the vials and getting them to the Department of Health. And just, I see that we want to adhere to a certain methodology. Is there some testing that's going to happen for those members of the custodial staff or others that are asked to do this? How's the... You mean training? Yeah, how's the health department going to train in terms of the methodology for collecting samples? You know, I, I, that's a question I would put to them. They were confident that they could run the operation uh, on their end, accomplish all the testing, and that they could also interface with the districts and the child care centers. Um, you'll see it requires a notice to go out directly to parents and to, uh, and to officials in the schools. I believe that Department of Health is going to produce the materials for that, and then the districts would be in partnership getting those out to parents through their networks. So there's going to be a, a, a teamwork mm -hmm. aspect of it from the get-go. But you're right, there will be some labor costs to local districts. Mm -hmm. um, and it, I should say it's the point of view of the superintendents and the school boards and the principals that they would like 100% of the remediation paid for. We didn't give them that, but I think we're substantially there for these people in providing free testing and then 50% uh, remediation. And that would, could, um, not to follow up, um, on that remediation, just how, it, how did we come up with that number of how to appropriate for 50%? What was the oh. estimating to, to say, Here's what we think 50% of remediation should be statewide. That came, well, the, the, the projections for costs come from Stephanie from JFO, and she can go over her modeling for you. If you mean, how did we land on the policy decision to cover half of the remediation? No, I'm sorry. I guess how did we um, just determine that for this scope of remediation, this is the amount it should cost on average, you know? Because I assume there was some, that number must be tied to a certain common scope associated with remediation. Yeah, so Stephanie would be the person to um, speak to that. She um, she worked out an initial model and then she revised it, I want to say, seven or eight times. So she wound up something that everybody was very comfortable with. Her initial estimates were very high. They came down to the to the point where you see them now with uh, two and a half million for the entire operation. Thank you. So this, this I will need to, yeah, I have to, go to committee leave to okay. start my committee at 10.30. One, one quick thing. I know that there were federal funds that were available and we yes. to apply by, I guess, a couple of weeks ago. Is that process in place? Uh, good question for the Department of Health. Okay. I assume it is. Um, they mentioned the possibility of federal <coughs> funding when they testified. The commissioner yeah. did come in and testify. Okay. Excellent. Do you have one more question? Okay. Oh, actually, that's right. Uh, independent schools. Um, the funding would also help remediation, at a, and these are approved independent schools? Yes. And did you get a number on how, like, how many schools that is? Stephanie has that number, and that's part of the, uh, I don't have the, the sheet with me. But, you know, as, as this committee well knows, you run into arguments anytime you um, use public dollars in independent schools. And I, I get that. My committee largely moved past that argument as secondary in this instance because it was <coughs> health related um, and we wanted to produce immediate action and make sure that that stuck on the other end. So independent schools were included as were Chinese. <coughs> Stephanie, could you put Stephanie on the screen? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you. If you'd like to switch out your room at any point with us, that will be the last reception of the month. Okay, um, I don't think the NEA is here right at the moment. We have the NEA is up next, and then we're going to hear from all of you who are here um, related to this bill. Oh, no, you're not on until 2.30. Mm -hmm. um, Jeff. Okay. What's that? Come on. I will pass that to the house. Directly. Okay. 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 Ok
Okay. Yeah, the bill got uh, Okay, yeah. we are just waiting for them to hear. Um, How strict is it? I mean, We've got a little bit of a complication strict? here in terms of um, the one. Budget Adjustment Act. Um, can't use one. I'm uh, not. <laughs> Sorry, Madam Chair. Give me my over the glasses teacher. Yes. Yeah, I can't wait till I have glasses. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, my understanding is at this point that is not in the Budget Adjustment Act and it has been taken out. That's what I understand. Bear in mind that we have to have to, to move this and to get it in the budget, we have a limited amount of time to do that as well. In fact, we have to have it to approach by the 22nd or is it the 15th? <coughs> 22nd. Uh, of March. For money crossover? <coughs> yeah. For, for, to, for us to move something to appropriations. Yeah. Is it the 15th? Oh, no, yeah, yeah. It's, so we, we, we have this week, and we come back, we have the next week. Right. That's all we have to do this. So it's just got moved to the fast track. Not here next week, right? No. You're not here next week. No, no we're actually going to be, you all actually do have to come in next week. Ah, yeah. uh, Kate, sorry. So we're, yeah. <coughs> we're waiting for... Yeah. Jeffrey Francis from yeah. Superintendent yeah. Association. Can I just, I want to get a point of clarification. So Senator Baruth indicated that the resources were in the Budget Adjustment Act. Yes. I thought I just heard you say that they're not. They're not. Which, so is that a Senate House issue or? It's a Senate House issue. The, the goal of upstairs was to move it. We just, we didn't have enough time okay. to do justice to it. So, um, so there's no possibility that a conference committee on budget adjustments kind of drive the policy on this issue, is there? Um, I, would, I would think not. Okay. Um, but I, I would imagine that we may end up going to a committee of conference on the budget adjustment. And it's almost March, and we're still doing budget. I see. So, okay, so the deadline that you're projecting yeah. could hold even with negotiations on budget adjustment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just because surprises happen. Thank you. Would you say, Madam Chair, that probably their budget adjustment will have the money, ours won't? In both. So, so, so we're almost more on a deadline of the conference committee than on the deadline of. For the Senate, I would say we're probably on the deadline of. The, of basically, we're going to try to do as much as we can, as quickly as we can. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to be looking to, we've, we've just got a few things. We've got, we've got a hearing tomorrow, we're not hearing, we've got a joint committee meeting tomorrow to deal with capacity issues. And then I would say that the rest of the time really needs to be addressing uh, S40 and those are the last little things that we're going to try to move. Um, I don't know what we're going to get rid of. If we can move this bill, it can be something we can catch later. Okay. Can I ask a question about that? Yeah. Just a little confused. Yes. Um, so there's this bill, S40. Yes. But on the Senate side, and what they want on the House side is it to be funded out of the BAA. Right. So like, it could have its own appropriations letter and just be like a regular House and Senate bill with an appropriation tied on how, right? Yeah. Uh, I'm just kind of wondering why why the mechanism of appropriating S40 through the BAA. I, I just don't really understand that. Silence. Is it, un <laughs> is it unusual? Can we can we say, what well, does that happen a lot? That, so Probably timing. They want to get it done as soon as possible. Yeah, it, it's and unusual for us to be doing the budget adjustment this late in the session. Is it also unusual to fund current bills that just started this year with the budget adjustment that really pertains to last year's budget? I'm just I think one of the things that, that, that like, complicates this is we're dealing with one-time money. And okay. in the years I've been in the legislature, I've not seen many opportunities for us to have one-time money. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's probably a problem of our riches. That's the $22 million or whatever that we were parceling out at the beginning of the session. Yes. That one time, like, yeah. And the governor also asked for this, yeah. too, so far. Uh, Joe. 
pick up on that enthusiasm while we can. We'll, we'll hear from the Department of Health. I mean, there's, um, are there, well, what I'd like to do is we have the NEA folks here, and I'd like to move uh, to them. We will have an opportunity to be discussing S40 uh, again today at 2.30. We will be hearing from um, the Department of Health, the Environmental Conservation, Professor from Middlebury and um, a school business manager. So that will be able to start to, and we aren't going to be able to hear from the attorney until tomorrow. Until tomorrow, I believe. So Grady? Oh, Grady, yes. Yeah. We'll okay, so we have people from the NEA here visiting with us. So we always like to hear from teachers. And you were going to be talking about perspective from the classroom. We actually have an interest in that. So I'm not sure who's up first. Yeah. Uh, Don, did you want to do anything? Or, or is, is Karen up first? Karen's up first. Karen's up first. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Karen Chitomer, North Country Career Center. I teach automotive technology. Hi. How are you? Uh, Congratulations on the upgrade in space. Mm -hmm. It's much nicer than across the hall, I won't tell them, but, um, and whoever was in charge of healthy snacks today, well done. Okay, okay. Would anyone like coffees? In the education world, we usually go digital and paper, but. We are really trying to work more towards digital. <laughs> very good, very good. It's always good to be prepared, though, in the event that the technology doesn't work. Right, exactly. Uh, thank you. Uh, in advance for the opportunity to present these items and for your service to the state. Um, I came into teaching maybe a little bit roundabout. As, as I was the youngest of five in a farm family, and joining the military seemed like the best route to a college education. Um, I was very fortunate to study aviation maintenance, and then I got my English major because I assumed everyone loved literature as much as me. And um, to my dismay, I couldn't let get everyone on board with that plan, but was drawn to career in technical education. Um, where, you know, we're seeing some interesting things, but not unlike every other school, right? So, you're serving on the most important committee, I would think, um, and Governor Scott very interestingly is hosting education forums where he tells us, oh gosh, you know, do more with less. It's concerning, right, at a time when we're kind of going, gosh, I don't know if we can do that. I think maybe we have to do as much as possible and maybe even with more, um, and that's maybe in, in what's best for students. So I'm going to tell you a little story, because I, they say that's what I'm supposed to do, that you might be more interested in me if I, if I keep it real. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you about my little guy. You know it's like real. Um, I have uh, six children, actually, three biological and three that we've adopted um, very fortunately through foster care. Um, and my youngest is a special case. He's brilliant, and he's so creative, and he loves to color, and he loves to read books. Thank God. Um, but unfortunately, this year he also became the kid in the classroom who was throwing chairs. And um, I can tell you that there are lots of calls you don't want to get, but one call in particular that you don't want to get is the one where your child has been restrained. Um, because, you know, not everyone gets to see who your kid is on an average day. But what I can tell you about developmental trauma is that we're only starting to understand and that kids with developmental trauma, when they're given direction or in their classroom settings, generally feel flight or fight. It's not their fault, and it's not something that they um, can generally avoid, but it is something that we can therapeutically work through over time. And why is my son like the, the reason I come to you? Well, my son is like the safety concern <laughs> that is everyone's big talking point right now, right? But interestingly, I also have other students who are just like him, kids that um, need to be given um, lots of movement in their day, lots of opportunities for sna snacks and to feel safe. Um, some kids who don't respond to a calm voice the way you would think someone would respond to a calm voice. And, you know, over time we have to learn their triggers, like what, what's this kid coming in with? And we don't know what their triggers are. A lot of times they don't know, but their body remembers. And so, what does this mean for your work? Um, you know, my son came to us after being separated from different <coughs> parents and having spent two of three years in foster care in really loving homes, 
um, but being bounced back and forth. And um, developmental trauma on the whole, right, can take a lot of different forms. It can be um, a death of a family member, it can be separation or divorce, and it can be, um, unfortunately, what we see most in the state of Vermont right now is that children are born to addicted parents who are not available for their care. So, in our area, we've seen a 100% increase in the number of children entering care, and that has implications for our work. Um, but because what we know is that children of trauma really have specific needs, and that if we do not address those needs, then we are feeding the prison pipeline, or the school to prison pipeline. And that's really right. Yes. the opposite of what a school <laughs> is designed to do. Um, what we want to do is funnel kids toward being really effective citizens who can do the work that you folks are doing, right? Who can come and serve the community. And I probably don't need to talk to you about um, doing a lot with very little pay, because <laughs> I think you're probably on board for that. Um, but, you know, what some states are doing is taking a comprehensive approach, approach at building capacity by looking at Department of Health Statistics, census data, um, law enforcement data and projecting what services might need to look like based on um, the number of increases in intakes. Um, unfortunately, we have a lot less people who are, I should say fewer, uh, people who are willing to work in education. Um, we have to get serious about how we are going to both attract and retain in the state of Vermont. It's my belief that if we're going to grow a strong and sustainable economy, that schools have to be um, a selling point. You know, people come to Vermont because it's beautiful, but they stay because it's a place where you can raise your children and have a quality education for them. We have to take that seriously. Um, truancy rates. It's not just high school students who aren't making it to school anymore. I'm talking about first and second graders who have to put themselves on the bus sector, you know, grabbing a cereal bar if it's, there's one available. And lots of kids are not making it through the door for us to offer them those services. So as we think about a comprehensive approach, we have to think about how we're going to get them there. Um, alternative programming. You know, we have a saying in our school, and it's that there's no more room in the inn. Um, lots of kids are being funneled toward more th therapeutic settings. <coughs> So for some kids, that's exactly what they need, and in some instances, what we're doing is creating situations, because we don't have the structures in place in our current buildings to serve them, where they're being funneled because there's really nowhere else for them to be that's appropriate. So we really have to think about, how are we structuring our current systems to meet the needs of kids that are coming through the door? In our state, quality early, early childhood programming is hard to come by. Um, I'm still a foster parent, and one of the things that um, prohibits me from taking a placement is whether or not I can offer that child child care, because I, I, I am still full-time employed, um, and I think that my students need me probably as much as these kids do. But one thing that they've, they've shown is a, a real support system for families who are struggling is if you can offer quality early childhood services. A lot of times other services are able to come in and wrap around the family. You can offer them meals, you can offer them um, consistency and routine, and I will tell you that one of the, the few places that my son had as a consistent caregiver was his child care. He may have bounced back and forth from foster homes to bio mom, but the, the child care was always there until it closed due to lack of funding. So. I, I, I kind of lay, lay that at your feet because yes, we do have a K to 12 issue. We have to kind of consider what that looks like, but continuity of care is of course important. Proficiencies and pathways. We could all say a lot about that. But here's the, the, the thing I guess I want to say is that we really have to narrow our focus and do one thing really well. And that really has to be figuring out how we're going to serve all kids well, yes, we want the cream to rise to the top and we want something there for them, but we also, you know, have an obligation, right, to support our neediest students. Um, proficiencies and pathways, if you've got a kiddo who's suffering from ACEs and developing, well, I shouldn't say suffering, who's experienced developmental trauma or ACEs, they're thinking about what's happening maybe in that minute, maybe in that hour, maybe in that day, but they are not planning for an entire semester's worth of work. Um, and if, you know, we're, we're serious about creating pathways, again, I come back to those initial structures, make kids feel safe, 
make sure you're getting them in the door and provide them with the services that help them be in the classroom. Okay, we do have this irony emerging. Um, it would appear that you know we've, we've done all this work around Act 46 and consolidating resources, and uh, many people think it's great work. If we're going to be serious about keeping funding in our public school systems available to offer the extensive buffet of wonderful opportunities that we are, um, we can't then say that we're going to voucher off students to private schools because we're doing the opposite of what we set out to do with Act 46, which was take those resources and make them available, right? So we can't then voucher kids off. It's essentially, programs like my own in a career center would cease to exist <coughs> because if everyone's putting their kids in a private school, that funding no longer exists for the great programming that we offer. Okay, and then my last ask, I know I was going to wax poetic here for a long time. Please cheerlead for us. <coughs> Let other members of the house know that quality education is expensive and, and, and we're worth it. Um, and as we mitigate every crisis that seems to be emerging, right, um, it's going to take it's going to take resources in the long run. Um, I guess I want to thank you one more time for listening to my diatribe, and um, I would ask if you have any questions for me. What I'm inclined to do because we're, we're limited on time. I'm not sure how many are speaking, but to get each one that's going to speak, and then ask you as a as a group. All in favor? I could ask 500 questions, I'm just, and I'm just thinking that when April break comes around and yeah. they're not under pressure, it'd be great to have all these folks back in to have yes. a long conversation. Yes, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Yeah. 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 I guess. Not a lot in my classroom, I'll tell you that. No nuts. <laughs> Thank you. For the record, please tell us who you are. Hi, so my name is Lauren Buck. Um, I live here in Montpelier, and I teach history at Spalding High School in Barrie. So since I have all sorts of paper, but apparently we're all teaching all, so that's pretty awesome. Um, Lauren, I'll just pull up your other time. Oh, sure, that's right ahead. <coughs> Um, and I'm now in my fourth year teaching history in Barry, and it's been a very interesting um, of dealing with all of the new circumstances that have come my way. Um, so Barry is an interesting place because we have a lot of students who come from loving, happy families um, who are well adjusted, who bounce into school every day, and they're just so happy to tell you what's going on. And then we also have a lot of students. Uh, who are struggling due to everything they are dealing with at home. And things like that can include bouncing around through the system, um, coming in because their parents have been incarcerated, um, their parents are not actively there for various reasons, um, drugs are becoming more part of their lives, whether or not they are seeking them out or because they're part of their home life and so they're just made more available for these students. And many of them are coming in without a lot of tools in their toolbox to be able to sit in a classroom and to be able to learn and be a constructive, contributing member of the classroom. Uh, many of my students are coming in hungry every day. While they have access to free reduced lunch through part of our school, um, either paperwork doesn't get filled out properly, uh, they're too ashamed to take advantage of that, and they're going without breakfast and going without lunch. I have students tell me all the time, oh, I only eat one meal a day. I'm just like, would you please just go get some food? Like, just do something. But like, oh, no, no, it's fine. Like, it's like almost like a badge of honor for them. And really, it should be something that is taken more attention to. Um, I have students who are either homeless 
because they physically do not have a home or are homeless because their families do not own a house and so they are moving around between friends' houses or aunts and uncles' houses. Um, I talk about one student in my uh, written portion here where in my first year of teaching she came in and she was so excited telling me that her mom finally got an apartment and she was going to have her own bed and her own closet. And she just couldn't get over the fact that she was going to have a closet. And I was just like, oh my goodness, okay, so this is, this is what's coming into my classroom every day. Is, I don't know what they were doing. Um, students love to come in and just, because people are not getting what they need at home, they will share so much with you because there's somebody who will sit there and listen to them. And so the stories I have heard about their parents were doing or not doing or what they're up to is quite <coughs> astonishing to me. And, and so the fact that someone even show up and walk through that school building every day, I think is so courageous for them. Um, Students are being asked to take on more at home. Many of my students have jobs, uh, partly to fund you know, their own pockets, but partly because they're also contributing to their own households as well. Um, they need to be able to pay for a car because their parents are working, and so then if they have younger siblings, they become the person, the point person, to pick their siblings up from school or to bring them to practice. So they are an additional parent in that household. And that takes a lot on them because then that makes them unavailable to either come early for school, stay late if they need to, get extra help if they need to. Their focus and their priorities are no longer on themselves as a student, but as another caretaker, as another provider in their family. Um, there have been a lot of great opportunities that have been provided and talked about in legislation. Um, one is through the Special Pathways Program. Barry has taken great advantage of this, and there are a lot of internship opportunities in the Barry community. They have been willing to open up their doors, and I've had students uh, take full advantage of that, and they come back either really excited about the stuff that they've just learned, or they just realize that, oh, no, I'm not going into that profession. I realized I thought of something else, and no, I'm done. And either way, it was a great opportunity for them to either just to see what it looks like beyond the school day. Um, unfortunately, uh, because going to a flexible pathway, getting an internship of this, necessitates the need for a car, this opportunity is only available to those students who come from families who have the ability to provide a car for that child to be able to be there. So there is a large uh, portion of the student body who will not have the same kind of opportunity because they cannot get themselves to and from these internship opportunities. So while it was a wonderful thing to provide and to be able to get this opportunity for them to have real hands-on experience, it's still only for the top few who are physically able to get themselves to and from the school when they need to. Um, the final issue that I wanted to talk with you guys about today is about proficiency-based graduation requirements. Uh, we've spent a lot of time over the past few years at the Spalding High School especially has been one leading charge of turning over to a complete proficiency-based grading system. Um, and there's a lot of things that we like about this. We have liked that we are focusing more on the skills the students need to be able to be uh, proficient. Um, writing skills, content skills, learning how to analyze documents in the history world. But that's all good. We like that we've been able to move our curriculum around that. However, some of the side effects of that are because proficiency-based grading necessitates that students can demonstrate proficiency at any point throughout a grading period, they've taken that to mean, oh, I don't have to do that by the due date. I can do that all at the end of this grading period. And they will put it off, put it off, put it off. Um, and so then when they get to it at the end of the grading period, something that we did in September, which they now have to show in January, they don't remember the details from it. They don't know what's going on, so we're not getting great work from them. Um, we tried implementing a two-week policy at Spalding High School where you don't get this on the first try. You have a two-week window in which you can show proficiency. After that, the teacher's moving on. I will accept any work from September to January. But now that means that all the students who didn't do their work throughout the semester are going to dump it on our laps in January which becomes a very high stress situation, not just for the teachers who have to do all this grading, but students are now scrambling to get all this work done that they haven't done throughout the semester, done in a very short window of time. And we cannot penalize or take points off for late work. 
which I get. You know, we're trying to let them show that they are proficient in something, that they have mastered the skill, which is wonderful. But at the same time, we're also teaching them that deadlines don't matter. And I don't know any job where if you turn in a report late, if you don't show up on time for something, that you're still going to have a job next month. And this is somehow becoming the behaviors that we are teaching to these students because they have all this extra time to get this work done. So while we are allowing them to show that they can do math or do history at any point throughout the semester and learn at their own pace, they are also now developing skills that will not serve them well in the professional fields. I just I'm feeling a little bit of pressure on the time at the moment. I know we have two more, and mm -hmm. I know there are also questions that people are going to want to ask. So um. I've been moderating mine as people said things that I was going to say. So I hope it helps you prepare. Thank you. Anyway, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, so that's it. That <laughs> I have a lot of things to say that were already said, so I'm just going to kind of jump right ahead. My name is Betsy Nolan. I teach music at Edmonds Elementary School in Burlington, and I live in the delightful city of Winooski. Um, so you've heard a lot about all of the trauma and um, issues that are happening, and basically what it comes down to is any societal issue that impacts our state trickles down to the public schools. And um, what I'm seeing is that we're not creating the school services our students need to be successful, but instead we're creating school services that the taxpayers are willing to pay for. And that leads me to believe that there's something fundamentally skewed about the way we fund public education. Um, I know that the majority of Vermonters pay based on their income because of the income sensitivity, but unfortunately, with rising costs of health care and other things that have nothing to do with how teachers actually do their work, it, it just isn't enough to meet the needs of the students that we have. Um, how it plays out for teachers when we do school consolidations and when we look at this, play this numbers games where we say, well, there's five, you know, it's a one to five ratio for teachers to students. That's not what's playing out in classrooms. I have 22 to 25 kids in my classrooms. At the beginning of the school year, I had 22 kindergartners in one class and 11 of them did not speak English at home. Um, and so I have never had a class that had five students in it or 10 or even 15, I don't think, in my entire career working in Chittenden County. Um, how this plays out is that we have more papers to grade, more parent conferences, more differentiation for our diverse learners, more support for struggling students, more enrichment for high flyers, more students in the classrooms who have experienced trauma and anxiety results in more teachers, the time being used to provide mental health services, which means all of those other things that we do, we do at home in the evening and on the weekend. And we went into education because we love teaching and we love kids, but I don't think that most of us knew that we were sacrificing our entire lives. When people ask me, you run such an amazing program, the kids love the work that you do with them, how do you do it? And I literally say to them, it's because I don't have kids. And at the end of the day, the amount of time to do the job well is completely unrealistic for a, a human being. Um, in addition to the amount of time that we put into meeting our students' needs and doing this kind of work, which for me includes like making sure every kid has a ride to the performance, contacting the PTO to get money so that we can actually have a performance and doing all these other things, now with the move to our new high deductible health care plans, teachers are spending, literally, I spent over 19 hours on the phone last year trying to reconcile my health records, working as my own health care administrator. My bills went to collections. I paid them. They said, the third party administrator said, oh, we already paid those. And I said, okay, I need documentation that you paid them. And they said, oh, we don't keep documentation that we paid your bills, which doesn't even make any sense. Um, so the future planning nightmare, right? Yeah, well, this is actually Data Path who told me that they don't keep documentation of the bills that they pay. So you add the increasingly challenging demographics of the students that we're working with, the tightening, the austerity measures, as they say, which is really code for shifting more work with less resources onto teachers, and then you add the diminishing benefits that teachers are getting with this new healthcare system, which I got to tell you, I am not confident that the switch from future planning to data path is going to solve the problem because it certainly hasn't solved it for this one individual person. 
So, you know, in closing, I'd just like to say that I love teaching in Burlington. The diverse culture and language backgrounds of my students creates amazing opportunities for teachers and students to learn about the increasingly small world that we live in. And uh, when I hear that state government is seeking to reduce the cost of education by shifting healthcare costs to teachers, increasing class sizes, and consolidating rural schools, I have to ask, what's more important than educating the next generation? I believe that the problem in Vermont is not that our citizens don't want excellent schools for our children, but that the structure of funding schools using property taxes is not meeting our needs. It's time to look at funding public education through income taxes instead of property taxes, and it's time for us to move toward a universal health care system for all Vermonters. And it's time for legislators and educators to work together to develop student support systems that respond to the ever-changing needs of our kids. Thank you for all you, you do. Thank you for your time today. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for coming on your, in the middle of your vacation. Mm -hmm. We got a lot of And um, Tom? I guess I'll round it out. Yeah. Looking for the record, so please tell us your name. Yes, so I am uh, I'm Tom Payer. Um, I teach math at Winooski Middle High School. I'm also the 2019 Vermont State Teacher of the Year. Um, thank you for inviting us here. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for um, I can't say enough that I, um, in in this role as a Vermont State Teacher of the Year, I am a, I view myself as a voice for teachers. Um, this is not about being the best or anything in that regards. Um, I'm surrounded by people who are incredibly dedicated to the future of Vermont, um, and it's a really humbling position to be able to uh, echo the sentiments that they that they uh, put out there every single day with their actions and words. So, uh, I know my time's a little short here, but I just want to give you a little story. Please, yeah. So, so, it's about motivation. It's about proficiency-based graduation requirements. So, me, I'm motivated to live, grow, and teach in Vermont because I firmly believe that educating with proficiency-based graduation requirements is critical in preparing future generations for the challenges of global climate change and emergent technologies. That's my motivation. Um, it's motivation, it's deep, it's powerful. Uh, I feel it as a force that wells up inside me whenever I'm in the classroom. It keeps me moving forward when things get tough. Uh, let's say if a lesson just totally tanks mid-class. Mid um, if I'm having a difficult conversation with parents or students about grading and curriculum, um, or whenever I, I hear in my classrooms, or just in general, uh, sentiments such as, I'm not good in math, or I'm never going to use this in my life, or they don't even know their multiplication tables. So when I encounter these challenges, I take them personally as an educator. Um, as a teacher, and especially Vermont's Teacher of the Year, I am both praised and condemned. Praised for accepting and responding to children whose families struggle with securing fundamental needs like nutrition and heat at home. Um, condemned for attempting to respond to those needs with innovative practices and addressing systemic bias heads on. And because I take these challenges personally, I often find myself facing crippling self-doubt and anxiety. Um, and if not for this motivation to make sure that all children have a chance to honestly understand and lead in the world they will inherit from us, I would have burned out years ago. This is only my seventh year teacher. <laughs> so my students, you've got to imagine, are no different. All of our students are no different. In fact, their experience is tenfold that of ours. I mean, I'm 31. Um, I'm fairly established. My wife and I, we live in Starksboro, Vermont. We own our own house and an acre and a half of land. Um, and I have, I have years of higher education in my, in my pocket. But my students, they struggle with agency over their lives each and every day. Um, perhaps they don't know if they'll be staying in the same apartment next week. They may be grappling with a family member who's fallen prey to the opioid epidemic. They may be shocked and confused by the sudden change of a system that used to value credits but now values proficiencies. So for me, I often think, where is and what is the motivation that moves them forward? Um, this question that's on my mind and in my heart each and every day I teach at Lewis Game and Proficiency-Based Classroom. Um, PBGRs implemented with Fidelity, as they have been implemented in Winooski, um, have given communities the chance to break past the barriers in, of imposed credits and seat time uh, to explore the deeper and more powerful driver of personal motivation. And it's messy work. A student and their family in a truly proficiency-based setting can no longer see a 4.0 and perfect attendance as the key to success. No, now success 
It's personal to each individual. There are no valedictorians. It's how well did you perform on your own personal motivations. Um, it's a big change from the external to the internal. And it's no doubt difficult for people to grapple with. Especially for students and family members who are constantly looking at themselves and thinking, am I worth it? Do I matter? Are my passions and interests what are going to allow me to succeed? So it's difficult, but I also believe it's great practice for the large disruptions our children will encounter in the future. It's close to impossible to measure discreetly in the moment. It comes about um, through trends and patterns that emerge through years of curious exploration. It exists inside and outside of a school building's walls. It illuminates the paths our students walk in their communities all seven days of the week. Our students deserve to be recognized for who they are, where they come from, and where they would like to go. PBGRs try to do that. Flexible pathways allow for that. So as such, I ask you to consider this fundamental question when discussing not only PBGRs, but all equity producing legislation that you will take up in the future. This question is, will this help all students develop and uncover their own personal motivation? You can do this by ensuring that learning environments are safe from the threat of gun violence, by instituting, educated, educa by instituting education funding structures that are clear to understand and fair to all Vermonters, and by supporting collaboration rather than competition between school districts who are grappling with what PBGRs mean to their community. Safety, common sense, and communication. These things create the environments that allow us as teachers, uh, educators, professional support staff to honestly and earnestly get to the work of empowering every single student. I hope that you see that as the ultimate goal. So thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I know that we've got other people here, but I just feel like we've got you, and I would like to take five minutes to allow for, for questions. Are there questions or for comments? Well, thank you all. My father taught <clears throat> for 30 years in Vermont, and so I have great respect for the work you do, and I remember his weekends grading papers in the attic, listening to David Bowie or whatever was on the radio. But uh, quick question on proficiency-based grading. I'm just wondering, um, to your testimony from, I think it was Spalding, I'm yes. sorry, Spalding. Uh, your name, but um, I'm wondering, you had indicated that the kids are not developing some of the I guess you call them like life skills and time management, it sounds like, in your implementation in the district. And it's interesting because part of the, the narrative I've heard around how proficiency-based education works so well is the grading system actually would give the kids the opportunity to develop uh, time management skills better or might actually grade based upon their preparedness, their ability to problem solve. And so I'm just curious about that, if you could describe it just a little more. I don't want to dwell on it, but. Sure, so we do the soft skills with all the habits of work. So yeah. we also grade them on that, but there isn't any uh, weight behind those. It, our school normally has them count towards sports eligibility right now. Everyone else really doesn't care anything about how accountable you are to the to how respectful you are or how much effort you put into something. Um, and so, we're having a hard time translating those types of skills into what that actually looks like, what that means, because colleges aren't looking at those, so parents don't really care about those either. There isn't really anything meaningful behind that sort of tracking right now. Um, people, we still have a grade point average in our school despite having Christian based grading because we can't seem to get rid of valedictorian, salutarian because uh, our school has that because. Um, colleges still care about those, and because scholarships still care about those. So while we in our little microcosm can have proficiency-based grading, it's also then difficult to translate that into anything beyond Vermont with other places that still do care about those things. Um, yeah, so we're struggling because we're, we have a foot in both worlds, and it's not working in that same sense because we're grading off proficiency-based grading. And because that allows them to develop this over time, that's great. But if they're going to develop something, they actually have to do it the first time to be able to develop it. And they're just, they see no buy-in whatsoever to even doing something. So the first I'm just time. gonna, I'm gonna walk. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, some, Winooski did something 
that other schools have not done. What was it that got you to the place? And I know that Winooski is one of the real leaders yeah. in proficiency-based uh, grading and standards. Um, and, I, and we may not have time now, but I know that I, I and the committee would be very interested in what is it that you got in terms of leadership and commitment to make Winooski a real, uh, one of the real centers that where, where it's working? I would say a lot of it had to do with the Partnership for Change money that we got through the Nellie May grants. Um, I don't know if you're aware of that, but yeah. Burlington and Winooski got a co-grant together to explore what student-centered learning is, um, something to the tune of $3 million over three years. Um, and that allowed us the flexibility to meet with community members in literally in their living rooms for the course of a year to talk about what is most important to this community. What would you like to see students graduating with in terms of large cross-cutting skills? Um, and we've defined six of those and we've stuck to them. We also have a leadership model within that school that respects teacher and student voice. Um, these things are built collaboratively within communities. They can find them out and what will work for them, um, but time, money, and energy needs to be invested to make sure that this really does work, and it can and it will work. So please stay the course. Thank you. Hmm? When is your April break? We want, we want to talk to you again. <laughs> Fourth week of April? April 20th. Yeah. 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 We'll expect you all back. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Just to sort of follow up from my testimony before, yeah. as you see, we're again all over the map yes. with implementation. So, uh, I'm, as I said, I met with the board of directors, just, just, just for the record. Don Tinney, yeah. uh, yeah. President Monnier. So, um, met with the board of directors, they approved the survey, so we'll mess some resources again to get done. We're developing the questions in the past week or so, uh, so we'll send that out. And, and also found out another another place is doing it well is Brattleboro. Mm -hmm. uh, they're doing good work down there. So we didn't, um, we'll find out where, you know, what the experience is, has been. The other thing that uh, you've heard a lot about, uh, student behavior and, and trauma-informed instruction, we are sponsoring a summit on May 20th. Uh, it's a Monday, so if you're still in session, you can still attend, but we'd like to invite members of the House Education Committee to participate. Um, we're bringing in the president of the Oregon Education Association. Uh, they've done a lot of work. I can forward the report on to you as well. Um, Secretary French will be uh, participating in a uh, breakout session. So we're hoping to bring a couple of hundred, at least 200 people together, including superintendents from around the state, um, to, to take on this issue of um, maladaptive behavior and, 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 and how that's going, because it is a huge issue. Thank you. Um, you know what? I've got the room filled with the next people. So are, is it possible to, um, to, you've got your contact information. Um, so would love to speak with you again. And I'm going to be a task manager on the calendar. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you all. So much. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks. 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 Thanks for being awesome. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Sorry, you know, we'll yeah. <laughs> kind of get a little something more yeah. no, to pull together. I guess you guys had to jet anyway. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, changing courses. Now we're going to be talking to the um, Vermont Association of School Board officials, and this is in relation to a letter that we see received. Um, and I'm looking for Frank. Coming in. Thank you, Justin. Well, few. Oh, no, I didn't just send them all on. <laughs> Frank. Hi, I'm Frank Rucker. Okay. Um, so you are going to talk with us about some of the challenges that your, your team Sorry. has experienced. Please okay. do. Um, and I did need a, just a moment um, to plug in. Okay. But we can... Um, did you send your testimony in to the committee? Uh, I just sent a couple of links. Okay. Uh, right. Yeah, I would say. Just yeah. Let's see. Hopefully, Shannon has. This. Did you Did you see those links, Shannon? Mentioned. Okay. Okay. So right. we're here to address uh, Act um, Act Eleven regarding the um, statewide uh, financial management system and the uniform chart of accounts, and I see Emily's. Here as well, so we're we're happy yes. that 
Emily Byrne is uh, joining us. Uh, Brittany is also um, joining us. Business manager, fellow business manager from the Middlebury uh, Area Systems. And Brenda is also on speaker phone. Oh, excellent. Okay, Brenda Fleming. Hello, Brenda. She's business manager at uh, Rutland Northeast. Um, Shannon, do you have a plug in for the laptop? Um, this one works? There's, a, there's something up right now. Yeah. Yeah. Turn around. Is that what you're, yeah. you're looking for? Turn around. And, and you could. Oh, yeah. um, let's see. Uh, so that here's here's our our letter. Yeah. Yeah. If we if I can just kind of scroll, I will do that. Thank you. Um, so we're we're here to discuss the uh, the request that I'm, I assume you have our letter. Uh, is is this uh, got our yeah. so there's three cats across the top. Yeah. Very good here. So this is the, the document that I wanted to essentially uh, expand upon. Um, I, I we really didn't want to deviate from the points that we've made here, but we wanted to answer any of your questions if you have them. We also wanted to create a little more context for you so you have a sense of what the challenges that we have seen in the field as part of the implementation of the statewide financial management system and the uniform chart of accounts. So uh, as you may recall, uh, Act 11, special session of 2018, um, essentially required a mandatory uh, implementation of transitioning from approximately 50 uh, systems that are in the 340 reporting entities in the state of Vermont, public, public school and or districts, LEAs, uh, to a single system. Uh, I think Emily made a very good point. I sent you a link to her testimony uh, to one of your Senate uh, committees, was it a week or two ago, about the complexity of, of the state and the way in which um, uh, we are all trying to adapt to, to a single system from many disparate systems and not, not one system using the current vendor that's been selected. So uh, it has some challenges. Here's our, here's our concern. Um, in, the, uh, in the first point we made, the, uh, the chart of accounts continues to evolve. I do want to, I do want to go to a second uh, um, sort of report that's on the Agency of Education's uh, website to sort of illustrate what it means um, to you as policymakers, to us as the folks that are trying to provide you with the information and obviously uphold the responsibilities of an employer um, and um, you know a business office in a, in a public school system. So a primary issue is that the, the business rules have not fully uh, been vetted or completed and there has not been a business cycle to interpret the results of uh, using a new chart of accounts that has just been um, developed. So let me uh, let me scroll over here to the uh, to the to the second uh, the second illustration I wanted to share with you. This is this is on the Agency of Education's website. You have the link. Uh, summary of the statistical report. Here's where I'll, I'll try to for those of you that have not. Uh, routinely uh, utilized the, the output of the, the uh, data collection system and reporting requirements. Here's the su summary information that's made available by the Agency of Ed, and it's, it's very useful for local school boards. Often it's a, it's made, it's a request of uh, legislators. I've been in, in school business management long enough to see where, where the legislators have asked for various sort of analyses of uh, per pupil cost, spending on administration, uh, a whole variety of, uh, of uh, data points that is inform us about how we are doing here in public education in Vermont. So a couple schedules I wanted to share with you and relate it to the chart of accounts that, that we are, we are uh, discussing and a little concerned about in terms of readiness. Um, we have an executive summary that, that uh, identifies the 
five on this schedule uh, billion dollars of spending uh, statewide. And and, uh, and again, this is the uh, this is the system that uh, we are transitioning to. Uh, that will that will continue to capture the information and uh, and provide uh, you with the information you, you're interested in. Here it is. Uh, so the, here's a, a, a sort of a functional overview of uh, how schools are funded. I, I am going to the Agency of Ed's site. You may have already noticed this is fiscal year 16 data. Um, if we looked at 17 and 18 data, I'm sure that that's, that's uh, to be posted. But, it, but the, the, um, the general uh, allocation of, of money is, has not substantially changed. Here, here is a functional overview. I'm using the word functional because I want to relate that to the chart of accounts. And again, the issues that are obstacles for us to fully implement what we're trying to achieve. Um, here is just, it's just showing that the blue there is primarily direct instruction expenditures. And uh, the, the rest of those pieces of the pie are the various student support, administration, capital, and so on. Um, what I'm going to do is just scroll to uh, the, the spending segment of this report. I'm just going through the revenues right now, and I'm going to get to about page 60. If you, if you wanted to look at this at again, again, page 60 is where we start uh, talking about it, uh, the, the various spending by uh, district um, and, um, and by supervisor reunion. And then implications for, for, for you as policymakers when, when we interpret data differently, when we record data from Brattleboro on from the Brattleboro area versus the Middlebury area versus uh, any, any other, the Winooski area that you just heard about. Um, so I don't know if we can see this data, but it's not to analyze it other than to, to say, these are the key right here. These are the key functional subsets. It says, here's what we spent on direct instruction. Here's pupil support. Here's the instructional staff. So this is how we invest in professional development to our staff. Here's our general administration, which is your principal office, our, uh, or, or our, I'm sorry, our superintendent and our school boards. Here's our school administration, uh, <coughs> transportation, and so on. Um, this, this is, this is a, a bill, over a billion dollars in capturing and making decisions every day, hundreds of decisions every day, about how do we account for spending the public's money. Um, as, as we go through the, all of this data, the, here it is by school district. I showed you something by supervisory union. Um, you, you, you'll see that we are talking about you know, thousands of transactions that require decision points every, um, you know, essentially every day, every hour of the day. That's what the business office is doing. This data also goes into detail around spending per student. And I'm going to go all the way to the last uh, page here and, uh, and then move, move off um, this uh, part of the discussion and just show you um, the, the, the structure of the current system, okay? This is the last page of this uh, link that's on the agency website. Here is the, here's the current structure of the chart of accounts that, that identifies things by uh, a program, by a fund, by a function, by an object. And uh, maybe one last, uh, one last uh, sort of data point that I want to share with you is, is where we're going. So I just, I just gave you a little bit of a glimpse. Uh, do we have that spreadsheet that's, that's linked here? Yeah, this, this is the one that had to be downloaded. Um, so the, the new system that we are going to, if, if I provided you uh, with a glimpse at it, not all that useful to see it on a spreadsheet, but it, but what I would be, what I'm trying to illustrate is that we are expanding the detail of the chart of accounts tremendously. We're redefining the way we capture costs, and and when we do that, we have to we have to have a, a business rule 
that we all abide by if we're going to provide you with meaningful information. Right now, if you went back to the schedule the, of the statistical report, you would see substantial variations between how much is spent in one district on, on student support services, and, and you would see it proportionally. There's, a, there's data in there that's percent, percent of total spent on student supports, percent of total on direct instruction. And, and, and then many of us in the field take that data and say, well, what are the correlations statewide with great outcomes? And, and we try to understand uh, to what extent uh, are our successful schools um, getting great results by the way in which they allocate their resources. And I know that's a topic uh, for uh, the legislature. Um, the whole issue around equity um, has a lot to do with um, how do we invest and um, uh, make a difference on, uh, with educational opportunity given the conditions that exist. So, the point I, I wanted to make is that uh, the business rules that we need to make all of these decisions on a daily basis have not fully been defined. Here we are in, in at our last business manager meeting statewide. We meet monthly. We don't have one system in the state that has demonstrated a, a transition to this new uh, software. Uh, so we don't, we don't have a pilot, we don't have a model that says we are capturing the, uh, the legislature's uh, goal, uh, which is to increase efficiency and, and uh, provide you with, um, with standardized information that you can make good decisions on policy. So uh, until that's in place, we're, we're asking for an extension um, to uh, July, uh, first 2022 to recognize that we have so many different systems coming from so many different uh, circumstances. This has never been done in Vermont before. Some districts are ready to go and um, we're fully supporting that. Others are, uh, are, are haven't even been formed yet uh, because of our recent Act 46 mergers. Um, so we, we, we're asking for the flexibility to move forward and allow us to scale a model that's based on success. Brenda, did you want to add to this? Uh, yeah, if I could for just a moment. First, I'd like to uh, thank you for accommodating me to be able to provide some uh, conversation on this important topic by phone. I am, uh, I have the pleasure of hosting the Agency of Education monitoring team here while they are uh, monitoring our federal spending. So thank you. I, I did not have the opportunity to drive up to Brown uh, But just to reiterate some of the things that Frank has shared with you, um, we currently have uh, no system operating on the new financial system. And the agency has created a beautiful um, crosswalk to capture our current disparate accounting system information into a uh, uniform chart of account structure so that the data points that Frank was talking about can still be captured. <clears throat> so what ASO is really looking at is wanting to see a successful implementation of both the new accounting system and the new chart of account, but we have to weigh it individually by each district for a lot of factors to help make it successful. For example, one of the existing uh, factors that every district is going to consider is their current capabilities and their current system functions and limitations. And approximately a third of the state of Vermont school districts are on older legacy software that have limited functionality. They are interested in uh, upgrading and are some of the nine that have volunteered to kind of move forward with this. A couple of other things, <coughs> the status of, of merger. So the voluntary merger is oftentimes the birth year, if you will, or the first year of the new merged district is the ideal time to implement a new chart of accounts as well as a new accounting system. But for some of the forced mergers that are happening now, they're at a situation where they have to <coughs> unify their operating procedures and their practices so that they can set up 
good business rules in order to um, be ready for a systematic and planned transition. So they may find it easier to wait an additional year to get that in place before making this uh, additional change. And as Frank was talking about the um, what each of our systems are going to be defined based on how we operate and our business rules, and that's going to be captured in the, the um, Vermont Education Handbook too, which really details how reporting information is maintained. It details the definitions of um, what type of function or object or level or how the different components are to be captured so that we can have some consistency in the outcome. So that as policymakers and as users of this data, we can look at things in a multiple of sections to determine, you know, maybe what K6s are looking like versus K8, maybe what an SU looks like versus a multi-district, maybe ferret out differences in regards to transportation because they can be very disparate throughout the state. So it allows us um, to, to really dissect the financial data in multiple different ways for multiple different purposes, but in order to have that be consistent and reliable data, the, the business rules that are defined in Handbook 2 really help set that up. Um, and, and then, you know, my final point, kind of reiterate what Frank said, was that the best hope we have for a successful outcome that we all want is quality training and a realistic transition and timeline. Forcing everyone to move in the last four and a half months of this year to be operational by July 1st could, could present some real challenges. There are currently two districts that are operating, but none of them are operating fully integrated general ledger accounting systems. They are either making journal entries to bring in payroll or using an outside payroll provider, or they're using journal entries to bring in their accounts payable. And even with that, they are finding that there have been at least two reported significant weaknesses um, to generally accepted accounting principles. Because it was two entities, instead of 360 or 150 or anything much bigger than that, both the vendor and the district were able to respond efficiently and swiftly to the situations so that they can adjust both their business rules, their systems, and their training for a better outcome for the majority of everybody who's going to follow. So I think in the letter that we sent to you in February, and again, thank you for the time to, to review this and, and listening to us, we have about nine districts who have self-selected that they would really like to go live for various reasons that I just talked about on July 1st. And they have a nice cross-section between school districts, single districts, supervisory unions, and tech centers. So they would be a great pilot group of leaders that would help the rest of us um, transition more smoothly. Um, so I, I did kind of send to Shannon, thank you for getting this, um, kind of my thoughts, these bullet points that I just went over. And as I'm reading, I noticed one major faux pas, and that is in the end I say, thank you for your consideration of delaying the FSBD, MS, and the UCOA until July 1st, 2020, and I mean 2022. If you just want to resend that, we'll, we'll repost it accurately. Uh, because we're, we're so ready to do the 2020. I know, right? Sorry about that. I will absolutely send that. Okay, I'm just looking where we also have, um, is Brittany in the room? Yeah. Brittany, Brittany is here, okay. Um, Brittany and Emily. Um, so why don't we hear from Brittany and then we'll have an opportunity to hear from Emily and all of you. And I'm hoping that we can let them know, okay. So, can you come? Sure. Uh, my colleagues have done a great job sort of outlining the environment and the day-to-day -day, um, world that business managers live in. So I just want to be really brief and kind of sum up 
some of the points in the letter for you. Um, the goal of the legislation is a good goal. It's uh, a goal that we want to see too, which is standardization in reporting data, making data more accessible, um, and easing administrative burden. But that's not going to be possible without the business rules. So if we don't have the business rules, it doesn't matter if object code 610, for example, um, is the code for supplies. What matters is what is a supply. And that's what hasn't been defined yet. So that will take a while. And it will take some, um, some trials, I think, um, some real on the ground sort of trial and error to determine what's working and what's not. So the business rules still are complete. As Brenda said, no school district, despite commitments to go live um, in October of 18 and January of 19, have been able to fully implement. So there are pieces that have been, been implemented, but not a fully working um, accounting and finance and human resources package. So many districts have a very robust uh, software, which does everything from recruitment to open enrollment, um, human resources, uh, payroll, accounts payable, all the things you would normally think of, purchasing, bidding, uh, those things have not been able to be implemented fully. And that could really be a hindrance to, uh, it'd be really a step backwards for many districts. So we haven't seen how the system works in real life yet. And then thirdly, as we've discussed, the, the, force, mer or the, the force mergers that are a bit up in the air, it seems, for some people. So there are some districts that are better positioned than others, but it would be really detrimental to some of the districts that um, the structures are unknown or sort of up in the air to have to force this. This is our chance to get it right for maybe the first time ever. And if we, if we rush into it, if we force it, then we'll have a system that maybe kind of works, but it won't be what we want. So I think that this is our opportunity to maybe take our time um, even when it feels like we want to rush into it because um, the outcome, the goal, is so laudable. Um, but this is our chance to get it right. So more time is what's needed to do that, which is why we're asking for July 1 of 22. So one of, one of my questions when people ask for more time, what's, what's going to be the difference? What, what's going to change over that period of time? Are there other things that you need, or is it just we're just going to be you know trucking along at the same speed but get it done. So what else, what's neat, what will happen in those two years? The business rules being fully developed would be critical. That will tell us where things go. Do you need support on that? I guess is what I'm saying. Do is it just time, is it just time that you need to do those rules? It, it, primarily time. I think. It, it is primarily and time and, and it is resources and uh, it is the, you know, it was part of Act uh, 58, I think, that essentially required the Agency of Ed to develop those in conjunction with a uh, consultant, and the Agency of Ed has worked very diligently with our own organization, the Vermont School Business Officials. However, they do not have the resources to fully implement uh, what's required. Um, the, um, uh, the other, the other issue to speak to your question is what, what will be different is as as the uh, the vendors as Brenda you heard Brenda uh, refer to as, as the vendor and the current pilot group surface system failures uh, and we've, we've seen them we've seen them in, in ways that are that would be s severe if we were uh, in, a, in a whole region uh, meaning you know missing a payroll date that's that's a severe uh, flaw. Uh, those things will get resolved if we have more time. Those things, as the pilots uh, uh, go through a complete business cycle, which is, as you know, uh, we start at any point in the year, there's a unique cycle. Right now, it's, it's budget development, and there's a whole lot of accounting process that goes through that cycle. Then in the spring, it's getting ready for fiscal year end in the, in the audit, issuing employment contracts, recruiting, making sure our staffing is all set. These are all system things we won't see until a year from now from the pilots because they're just training and trying to get these things off the ground. There's the whole financial reporting interface. Uh, again, we haven't seen a complete financial statement out of the system, so we don't know how well we're meeting the needs of our school boards, our general public, our auditors. Uh, there's a great deal of reporting for the IRS, for the Agency of Education and so on. 
we, we need to go through that whole cycle to say, does the system capture um, what, what you know, so many different entities are interested in? And, um, and it, it, it's, it, it is complex and it's, uh, it's uh, cumbersome having come from where Vermont is now, which is a, a very decentralized and non-standardized uh, process. So those are, those are some of the key points. Okay, I think I would like to get um, the agency up. Yeah. Yeah. You want me to remove my... Uh, you can do whatever. My... <laughs> Hi, for the record, Emily Burns, Chief Financial Officer from the Agency of Education. Um, this is an interesting and challenging and I think really critical issue for the General Assembly, for the agency, for school districts, and for the state. Um, if you told me a year ago that the legislature was going to mandate that this process be implemented, that these, this system be implemented at all schools, I wouldn't have believed you, and then this came down. So that kind of changed how we were doing our work and what we needed to do in terms of meeting the mandate. Um, as passed by the General Assembly. So the I think to clarify, one of the confusing things around this issue is that there are actually two mandates in legislation. There's a mandate around the uniform chart of accounts, and then there's a mandate around the implementation of the statewide financial system. The uniform chart of accounts, I believe, initially was passed by Martha Heath and Jane Kitchell kind of worked on that. Um, Martha hasn't been in the legislature for at least four years, so this was in, I believe, the 2012 or 2013 budget initially. So the initial work on the chart itself started at that point. I know the agency did some work um, with a contractor to help write the chart to do that work, move forward. Um, in conversations with VASBO and with the agency, there was a dis we decided that the easiest prob way to do this probably was to have a statewide system that the agency would be able to monitor the chart and implement the chart at a central level. So part of the issue is, is once the chart is implemented, how do you make sure that everybody continues to follow the chart accordingly? So we went out for an RFP and procured the statewide system. Um, again, the assumption was a year ago when we bought that, that there wouldn't be a mandate and that school districts would be able to get onto the system when it was right for them. Um, that is not the case anymore. So now that there, now there's this mandate. Mandate. So the chart of accounts piece, the initial, the legislation said that the chart of accounts was to go into effect on July 1 of 2019. So five months, four months from now. And that the mandate that was passed last year was that the system would be the same by July 1 of 2020. So part of the challenge was that how do you implement a system but get the chart done in your old system and then tweak your current system so that you could get the new chart into that system. So um, we worked with the Senate during the budget adjustment process to have the mandate for the chart of accounts align with the current mandate for the financial system. So I think you were supposed to pass the budget adjustment today, and I don't know if you did. No, no. Um, it'll be on the floor tomorrow, so, so we hear. So once that passes, that will realign the two systems. So what that will do is buy us a year to work on the handbook um, that Frank and Brittany and Brenda spoke about. I think that is a critical piece, right? The data is only as good as the data you put in, and if we can't, don't have a agreed upon understanding of what the data means, then we're not going to have useful information. I do think that the um, need to acknowledge that the chart, the chart itself won't evolve, but our understanding of the data will evolve. So to the extent we will get a book together, we will understand things. Once you get into the nuances of individual accounting transactions, there is a possibility, you know, in the first year of rollout, we're going to find out that one district did this and the other district did this, we'll have to move forward. So the legislature and the agency, school districts won't have perfect data right out of the gate anyway, and I think that's an unrealistic expectation to have. Um, but I think any movement forward is progress. Um, so the agency um, has been working with districts who are ready to implement right now. So there are, eight dis there are four districts that are currently on the system. They have had some challenges. We are working with the contractor to try to get more resources out to them to make sure that they are um, better poised to finish implementation. There are eight districts currently working on implementing between now and July 1. 
There are another eight that are working on implementing between now and December 31, so January 1st of next year. And then everybody else in the state is sort of teed up based on the mandate, right? So we have to assume current law is current law, that they will go forward and start implementing on July 1 of 2019 to be live on July 1 of 2020. So that's sort of where our schedule is at this point. So, so just in terms of doing, so there are four that are doing it now, eight more will be this year, and you said eight more. So we're looking at about 20? By January. But, okay, by January. And I guess the remaining 23 by on the following, July 1, through that. Um, part of the challenge that we had, the initial implementation phase was only about six months, and as we got into it, we realized there were some issues with the chart itself, which really made implementation challenging. So we did have some schools that were ready to go that dropped off because there were a lot of unknowns at the time. Um, we have you know, tried to figure those out, I think, as um, the members of VASBO outlined, that learning opportunity is critical. Um, you don't know what you don't know until you realize you don't know it. Um, and then how do we make sure you haven't made a bunch of decisions around something you didn't know, sort of what the end of the road looked like until you got there. Um, as with any IT implementation, not just financial systems. So I think, you know, we will continue to, we have, so I think there is a lot of work to be done. You know, the agency did not get extra resources to do this in terms of human capital. We are looking into one of the great suggestions we got at the VASBO meeting last week was to hire a, why well, I didn't think of it, I don't know, but to pull in a contractor to help us write the business rules. So in the last three weeks since we've met, we've been working on trying to figure out what's the fastest way, given state procurement processes, that we could get somebody into the agency to help us start those business rules. So to recognize that the agency doesn't necessarily have a human that we can dedicate to that work, but can we hire somebody who will move forward go out to the districts and meet with everybody um, and try to get that business, those business rules written before everything goes live a year from now, or 18 months from now. That would just be an outside consultant mm -hmm. on a temporary basis. On a temporary basis, basis. yeah. And that's what we did initially. So when the legislation first passed, that's what the agency did, was hire a contractor to help write sort of a first pass of the handbook. Um, but it needs to be updated because it's been several years since that was completed. And we know more, given the system and the mandates of the system, what will be what's needed in that handbook. Um, we're moving forward with that. Do you have a second part of your question? I forgot if I had another question. <laughs> <laughs> are, are handbook and business rules the same thing? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. You're going to keep going? Or, or I don't know. No, I think I'm. You can oh, okay. I guess, what I would so, say is, so, oh, good. Yeah. So they're asking for a two-year delay. Mm -hmm. the, You're saying no delay. The agency's position yeah. is that um, the uniform chart of accounts is a long time coming. Uh, and that this, to the extent education spending keeps growing, and to the extent pressure on taxpayers continues to exist, the information and data analysis that having everybody on the same system will provide I think is important um, for the legislature and for policymakers. Um, in a perfect world, we would, you know, have a slower implementation process probably. But I think the the benefits of getting that information to the general assembly for decision making is important. I think what we've learned in the first, you know not quite a year of implementation, will be helpful in the remaining 18 months of implementation across school districts. I don't think it will be perfect either, but I think it's important, the agency thinks it's important that we move forward um, on the timeline outside, outlined by the General Assembly because of the benefits that it will provide um, to policymakers going forward. But if the information is not accurate, it can be helpful. Sure. So the agency, um, if we're able to find a consultant to help us write the business rules, work with the business managers to help work on that, I think the, the language change in the Budget Adjustment Act to push the Uniform Chart of Accounts out a year buys us the time necessary to do the work on the business rules. Just 
there are there's already a one year delay. We're already pushing it out one year. Is that what you're saying? The implementation of the uniform chart yep. is being if the budget adjustment passes, which right. is waiting for the house, I believe. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. So that came over just to clarify. That came that was the Senate's recommendation. They put in the just budget adjustment act, and we will be hearing about it tomorrow. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. It's an. Uh, I can't remember what the amendment is too. It's a funky. It's written funky because it's an amendment to session law from 2013 that was amended in 14 that was amended again. So it's like the third amendment to session law. But it will push the implementation of the chart out to align with the system. So that, then that day would be the chart account would be July 1 of 2020. 2020. Okay. And same with the system. Yeah. You have ten of Austin, Jim? Yeah. Yeah. I just um, first. I want to thank you. I mean, being a former school board member, I, I love looking at this data. I mean, I have no clue how you get to it, but I really like using it. I love data for decision making and to inform kind of decisions. But it just sounds like a her Herculean, Hercule Herculean. It just sounds like a huge <laughs> endeavor. I mean, to me, I, I just, I wonder if it's realistic, the timeline. You know, along with Act 46, with the merger, I mean, I think you want to do it right, you know, and be realistic about what people can do. I think people tend to, like, if they're in a hurry, then they're, you know, it impacts their thinking. And so I just want to be realistic. You know, it, it would be nice if it could be implemented sooner, but I, I, I just assume have that 2022 an end date, and if it happens sooner, great, um, and everybody's happy. but. I guess I'm curious because I, this business rules, like if you, Frank, had a magic wand and by 2022 you could have everybody on the same page in terms of three of the top business rules that you would want, what, what would they be? Well, I would say because we are mostly uh, staffing, um, it's, it's uh, uh, defining the, the various uh, levels of staffing and what they do. Uh, I know the legislature has uh, considered uh, s a staffing ratio analysis. I think there's a report to be presented um, about that analysis. Um, and that gets at how do we employ our, our staff to address student needs in a variety of different levels. And so in terms of business rules, I would refine that definition because uh, an example uh, around um, recording a fairly significant amount of an investment that Vermont does, uh, Title I funds. Uh, I know I, I record Title I funds in the general fund. It's part of the academic support cost centers that folks see when they look at our budgets. I know other business managers and systems put that in a special revenue fund. It's not part of the general fund. And, and when, if you were trying to make a decision as a policymaker statewide, and you saw our level of investment would be much, it would appear to be much higher than a neighboring district that, that may do the same thing, but they record it mm -hmm. differently. And therefore, you might make a decision, well, look at, the, this system doesn't spend that much in student support, so, and they get great outcomes, so let's go in that direction. And I'm, I'm suggesting that that would be a disaster for the kids that need uh, intervention services more than, than anyone else. So that's, that's one example uh, that's very significant. Another, a second uh, business rule issue is around, we are hearing a lot about benefits um, and the way we record the cost of benefits. <clears throat> Just recently we've gone through uh, negotiations that have brought in uh, the HRA benefit and the HSA benefit, relatively new to uh, many districts, not to all, but to many, and that coincided with the VHI uh, plans all being <coughs> terminated and then recreated uh, a couple of years ago to comply with the Affordable Care Act. So within that very substantial amount of business, um, some folks say, hey, let's have a code for HRA. Uh, you know, Let's create the code 212, it's an object code. Some say, let's create one for the HSA. Some say, no, we don't need that because you realize when you start fragmenting data like that and some have it and some don't, <coughs> people will make conclusions 
that are not consistent. And, and then other folks will argue, well, you can roll it up and you can have aggregate data. So there, there's a second area of very significant investment. I would say a third is <clears throat> at the project level. Uh, project level accounting has to do with the many millions of dollars. I know in the Brattleboro system we get about six million dollars in, in federal funds. Uh, and those come in in a project definition. What did you sign up to accomplish? And tell us how you spent that money against a project code. Excuse me, Frank. Can I can I just add something? Sure. Um, the information you're saying is really valuable, but I want to remind everyone that the state has already implemented, and we utilized it last year, and has the ability to utilize it during the transition period. A crosswalk that brings everything that Frank is talking about um, that might be recorded differently from district to district into a uniform crosswalk so that the data that you guys recommended and appreciated looking at and evaluating becomes much more uniform. So I think one of the things that I didn't really know how, and I apologize being on site trying to interject, um, is that one of the best things that we would get with more time is more thoughtful, proactive implementation versus reactive as a problem resolved or a problem is aware. And having that pilot group go first, being able to identify those things so that the next layer, the next 20, the next 40, the next 50, until we get all supervisor unions and all districts converted, we'll, we'll be able to do it more thoughtfully and proactively versus reactively. And again, the agency has this tool that takes our disparate data and consolidates it in a uniform way so that we can still provide and review the data that, that, that's so valuable for making decisions. And I'm really sorry because I don't know how to interject when I'm not there, so I apologize for being rude. Uh, I, if I could just yeah, finish that sentence. Finish it up yeah. here, and, and that is, uh, so I appreciate Brenda's point and, and that's the data, but it's not the business rules. So you were you are asking the question about well, what what do we need for rules? So agency have done a, a very good job in prepping the data, but we, but we haven't said how do we record it, so those rules. Thank you. Thank you. I think we are going to take a five minute break and find our next people that will be speaking with us. Thank you. Yeah. He's not pleased with it. That's Zach Ralph's bill. And he's, you don't have to sign on to it. Yeah, but I agree with the concept. Which bill? From the one, the one to make like California and any new buildings in the state have to have solar panels on them. Rep and Ralph. There you go. Rep and Ralph. There you go. Bless you. Well, interesting. Well, I, I assume all new buildings. What? You know, you'd be, you'd be crazy not to. Well, it's pretty. Yeah. At the market. Yeah. 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 That's what shut the market down. Guys, one and a half minutes. Yeah. 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 Um, we are now back to S40, an act related to testing and remediation of lead in the drinking water of schools and child care facilities. And on deck, well, we've got Brittany. Same person, different is, topic. Is there, um, was this order, I'm just wondering, Sam, this is the order of the recommended Okay, okay. 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 So, Brittany. Hi. Oh, oh, yeah. Could you sure. come back and join us? Sure. I don't know. Thanks for having me. Okay. For the record again. Yes, um, my name is Brittany Gilman. I'm the business manager for Addison Central School District. So the purpose, the reason that I wanted to come here today was to share a little bit with you about the results that we've been seeing at Addison Central School District with our lab testing. So in January of 2019, we partnered with Middlebury College to do some lead testing. And in an effort to be proactive, we've already begun some remediation efforts um, based on the recommendations of researchers. But I do have some observations about S40 as it's currently written. 
um, in S40, so you can see my points in the letter. I'll just review them briefly. As currently written in S40, uh, the definition of outlet could be interpreted to include all outlets in a school, even those for which utilization for drinking purposes would be unlikely, such as a uh, bathroom or utility sinks. And this definition could reasonably be expected to lead to more extensive renovation. In addition, I have concerns about funding. In the Senate proposal of amendment to H97, $860,000 has been allocated to fund the estimated 50% state share of tap remediation costs. My belief is that this estimate may be significantly underfunded based on Addison Central School District's estimation of remediation costs. So at a three parts per billion action level, um, in speaking with my uh, facility folks, we estimate that remediation compliant with S40 could cost between $80,000 and $100,000 for us conservatively. This assumes replacement of fixtures only and does not include plumbing and replacement costs for more distal piping, which does not appear to be an issue for um, Addison Central School District. It could be an issue for others. So certainly if more distal piping is to blame for other school districts, the cost could increase exponentially. So we fully support testing and remediation efforts. I think that's evidenced by the fact that we've been proactive both about testing and about remediation. But I would urge the legislature to consider additional funding to complete this initiative. <coughs> and that's, that's for remediation you're talking about? Correct. Yeah, additional funding for remediation. Correct. I believe the bill is, uh, is currently written already uh, covers testing. Covers testing, so. okay. Under S40, there are some exceptions that you don't have to do testing if you already have recently. As you're reading in the bill, that, that your district would fall into that category, you wouldn't have to retest. Or um, I'm I'm not clear. I'm just curious whether a, a recent initiative to test would, in some way, somehow not meet the letter. So I hear that you're not clear on that. Yeah, I'm not clear whether we would have to retest or not. Okay. That's less of a concern given that the testing is is funded by the would be funded. Okay. And um, that. 80,000 to 100,000, is that what your estimation is um, that's across your district? Mm -hmm. And is that the 50% or is that the entire that's amount the, for me? That's the entire. Right, so half that reimbursed. would be what would be. Correct. Would be reimbursed. <coughs> Questions? Just to be clear, it's not the sounds like uh, the concern is um, perhaps clearer definition of what fixtures would be affected by this bill so that we're not necessarily having to fund replacement of a mop bucket <coughs> filler as opposed to something that people are actually getting portable water from. Right. Okay. And your concern is that this is a little broader and it, it could actually include those those fixtures. Yeah, I think that the reading of it could be in, um, could mean that you would include those fixtures. Obviously that increases the remediation costs. But the janitors Mops and perhaps might be one that says not drinking water. Right, yeah. yeah. We also yeah. have, you know, showers, other utility sinks, bathroom sinks. Unlikely people would drink from a bathroom sink, chemistry lab sink. Mm, people fill their water bottles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, they probably shouldn't, but it probably happens. Yeah. Um, there are some, there, you know, when we talk about the three T's, some of that's training. So there's the hope that we could have protocol that you would not drink from those sources. Or let them run for 30 seconds. Okay. Yeah, so most of our results were below the three parts per billion action level upon flushing. Uh, I don't have the exact number, but I would say that the majority were fine after being flushed for 30 seconds. Okay. So in terms of your sense that the number of 30 parts per billion seems like a reasonable thing that would not have been harmful to your district in terms of cost, but perhaps uh, more appropriate for your students? I'm sorry, can you I'm repeat sorry. the question? Let me just no. ask it simply. Okay. The, the number three parts per billion, does that seem like a reasonable number to you? Well, I'm not a public health expert, yeah. but I don't think, um, that's not really what my concern is. But, but to be clear, ACSD is remediating to three parts per billion. We are remediating to three parts per billion, mm -hmm. yes. And how, why did you choose that number? Because, the, because we believe that that's what would be imposed by the legislature. Okay. So that came first? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 
Representative Austin. Real quick, just is it safe to assume that all federal funds, grants, low interest loans, everything federal is being looked at to, for funding as well? Is that safe to assume that someone is doing that? We can talk to the Department of Health about that. Okay. Thank you, Brittany. Thank you. Maybe talking to you again. We're, we're just been opening this conversation and we're, we're new to this topic. I'm sorry, I'm going to excuse myself. I have an annual meeting tonight. So yeah. <laughs> Thank, Thank you very you. much. Did you have a question? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I have a very tentative hand raised. Okay. Have we heard yet about the relationship between parts per billion and the cost of no. money? Okay. So if we you, are we are very much in the beginning. Okay, I didn't miss that. All, all okay. we've had is we've had um, <laughs> the senators come up and introduce the bill to us. We have not had the lawyer our lawyer come in and, and present the bill to us. So all we've heard from is those and her. Now we're going to be going to the Commissioner of the Department of Health, who will be likely one that can answer an awful lot of the questions that we have about the health So welcome. Now that I have great expectations to satisfy, <laughs> uh, Mark Levine, Commissioner of Health. Um, let me open with uh, something that the Department of Health should do, which is provide a little synopsis about lead and the impact of lead, so you know why we're talking about this in the first place. Um, there are many areas in medicine that controversy exists, and where we sort of say, well, this probably isn't good for you, but I'm not absolutely certain, um, and the science may not be so perfect. With lead, it's much more black and white than gray. And to say that there is no safe level of lead in the body is a truism. We also know that there are members of our uh, human race amongst us that are even more vulnerable, and they tend to include children and pregnant women. And um, lead can damage many organs, such as kidneys, but with regard to the groups I just mentioned, we're most concerned about their nervous system and their brains. And at the time, especially for young children, that they are developing brains. So what can lead do in an adverse way? Lead can impact their ability to learn, can impact development, can impact the kinds of behaviors uh, they portray, whether it be in a learning environment or a non-learning environment, can impact their growth. Um, the thing about lead that's most profound is that the effects can be irreversible and permanent, um, but they are preventable. So like many things we test for, lead unfortunately is colorless, odorless, tasteless. Uh, so if you really want to know if it's present, you have to test for it. Um, I want to be clear that Drinking water is not the major way the members of our society who have lead poisoning uh, get lead poisoning. It's, it's a component of that. The most prominent way is if one lives in a house pre-1978 construction, uh, getting it from paint. And um, the estimate, and this is an estimate from the EPA, about the, the burden of one's lead burden, the component of one's lead burden that comes from drinking water is 20% or more, but certainly not as high as what we can pay. But it's still significant, obviously. I'm sorry, you're saying that 20% of the lead burden in, burden in a child, let's say in a child's body who yes, has uh, high levels of lead would probably come from the drinking water. So it isn't helping, but it's, um, it, and it clearly can be hurt. But the biggest component may still be paint from the child's environment. How does it get into the water? You know, uh, through lead pipes, and, and especially in older construction. But as you've been hearing uh, a few times here already, uh, fixtures, and specifically lead soldering fixtures. Um, and then you have to look at what the water is like. Is it what you would term a corrosive water? 
with a pH that may not be perfect for the human body to ingest things in because it can affect how much lead will be leached into the circulating water. So why are we even here? We're here because the Department of Health actually did a pilot study. Um, so we kind of began this troublesome pathway that we're all on now because the pilot showed us things that um, you wouldn't want to see. Because again, if you don't test for lead, you don't know what's there. So we piloted it in 16 Vermont schools. And we tried to be somewhat representative in terms of um, the kinds of communities they represent, the geographic location, et cetera. But you know, with 16 schools in a state, it's not going to be a perfect um, sample, if you will, that uh, everybody can be matched up against. But it was somewhat representative. What did we find? This was done, by the way, 2017, 2018. We find that if we use what is termed the EPA action level of 15 parts per billion, which everyone has been hearing a lot about here, that at least one tap at five schools had elevated lead. If we went down to what we termed the Vermont Health Advisory, which is a level that we set out in our health department of one, all 16 schools would have taps that obviously had lead that exceeded the level. Um, and, and it was at least three taps in each of the schools. So if that pilot is all is at all representative, that would give you some view, if you will, preliminarily <coughs> of, of how that would look. And of course, the conclusion that was inescapable was that um, all schools must test every fixture that carries drinking water to know if Vermont's children are safe from consuming lead-tainted water. I heard a discussion earlier about um, religious schools, independent schools versus public schools. Uh, certainly from the Department of Health standpoint, um, and, and in 2019, even more than ever before, we are all about the concept of health equity. Health equity meaning everyone has the same opportunity to be healthy. And so our advocacy would be that all schools be tested for lead, not differentiated by uh, their label, if you will. Um, one thing that uh, occurred, and while I'm giving you some, some numbers here, as we testified in front of the Senate committee, and as you heard, um, there was the newer initiative of examining uh, daycares, child care centers, um, the, uh, a huge majority of, whom, of which are in homes. Now, there was already a testing program in place um, for those that didn't quite adhere to the same testing program that we used as a pilot in the schools or that has been written up in the bills. But at the same time, um, it gives us a glimpse at uh, what went on in those places. And if I can just, uh, and we can provide you with this data, but um, <coughs> if we looked at the school data and the first tap draw results, draw tap results, uh, from the schools, and the level um, were set at greater than one, 31% of 38 schools were positive. That includes the 16 pilots and 22 schools that, after they heard about the pilots, said, me too, we'd love to get involved in this. Certainly not a majority of Vermont schools, but another sample. If the level were at three, which the uh, Senate committee, as you heard, uh, advocated for, 18% uh, of the TAP results were positive. First draw. First draw. <clears throat> level at 15, 4%. Looking at the daycares, and you may be somewhat reassured by this since most of you live in homes, and these were homes, essentially. Um, if the level were at one, 
it would be 73 out of 486 homes, which was 15%. If the level were three, it would be 22 homes, 4.5%. Keep in mind, that's lower than what the schools found. And then a level of 15, uh, 1%, five homes. Uh, so just to give you a, a sense, these are, again, ballpark numbers looking at the sample size that we have uh, to provide you with information. The, the word level is also important to clarify because there are the so-called action levels, which you're going to hear about from others providing testimony, uh, which really have to do with the EPA and water rules and those who are involved in another agency in our state. And then there are more health-related rules. For lead, you know, there's only the American Academy of Pediatrics um, statement, which essentially says there should not be any lead. Um, so if you look at other states' experiences, you know, we found maybe a dozen to 15 states that actually address this. Um, it's not like 50 states have already done this and Vermont's way behind. Uh, so there's not that many states. And as uh, <coughs> Senator Baruch alluded to in his comments, um, the majority of those states are actually using levels of 15. Uh, one state specifically went down pretty much to zero. Um, and that state did not actually factor any remediation of the cost into the legislation. They just said schools have to do this. Uh, and schools others have, used... Schools have to test this or schools have to cut results? Have to test it and remediate. And remediate. And then uh, on a handful of states used five, which is the FDA level for what is permissible in drinking water, that, in, in bottled drinking water. Um, so just to give you a sense of the, the playing field out there. Um, we were asked to you know, provide some data originally about what this whole enterprise would cost. And we were able to provide some data showing what it would cost for 450 schools with an average of 50 taps per school, two samples per tap, $20 per test at the health department, and that comes out to $900,000. We did not uh, estimate for daycares at the time. Um, a sort of rough back of the envelope calculation for them though, if there's approximately 1,200 facilities and you still do two samples per tap, but they are more like a home where there might be one tap where the drinking water is going to be utilized, that's still 2,400 samples, which is another $48,000. What we learned in the pilot was that uh, for remediation, the average cost was in the $500 range, which was mostly replacing the fixtures. We really feel that any system that is developed through legislation um, should be on a timeline that's reasonable, obviously. Uh, the governor's uh, original speech uh, committed to a one-year timeline, uh, but that it needs to be done right. And it's a very complex process. If you just think about uh, what little was just discussed about um, how are these samples actually being obtained, um, are they going through an appropriate protocol, um, are we getting data that is actually true, the true data we want and not going to be a false positive or false negative because of the way things were, were, were handled. Um, <coughs> the kind of communication that needs to occur amongst uh, the health department and the Agency of Natural Resources uh, with regards to testing and remediation, the kinds of data management that needs to occur uh, for this number of taps. Uh, I just want to lay out the, the fact 
we're not intimidated by this, but this is a very complex uh, process potentially. And you want to do it right because you don't want to be in the position ultimately of reassuring parents in Vermont their kids are safe and actually things didn't go the way you anticipated at all. So we want them to go well, we want them to go right. Um, the, v, the Vermont Department of Health Lab is certainly prepared to um, do testing. Testing is now getting into the extraordinary number of samples, so the lab would want to be able to retain the ability to have labs that are certified that they choose to uh, be part of the process so that uh, things get done in the, in the timely manner that they're requested to. Um, We certainly were very well prepared to um, meet the one-year time commitment uh, in our original proposal. Um, with the addition of daycares, it does complicate things a bit, just because of the sheer number of those. I think those are the major comments I wanted to make from a health department-centric viewpoint, if you will, and without stepping on too many toes of people who are going to also testify today. Okay, I think we have DEC coming and I'm going to be asking how lead gets into water. That might be a better way to what? ask them. Um, in terms of a couple of questions, is there any, I think it's for chelation to help get... Um, yes. So, so if you have a child, we have about 50 per year um, children yeah. who test high. The good news is we actually have a very high rate of compliance with testing kids. It's at ages one and two. All um, kids? You test, uh, you, your goal is to test all goal kids? Goal is all. We're okay. probably in the 80s percent of, of getting that accomplished. Because that's, conti that's contingent on parent behavior, pediatrician behavior, et cetera. Between one and two years of age? Yes. Did you want to so that's them? done through the pediatricians? Yes. We process the samples. So we're aware of anyone who has a high level. And these are at, on a different scale. So it's not through level of 3, 5, 15. This is level in blood. Uh, so don't try to compare that to what we measured in the water itself. Where but for someone who scores high, yeah. um, there may be a need for chelation. And chelation is done either in the hospital, if necessary, or can be done actually as an operation as well. Um, so there's a lot of factors that go into the decision making about that, but it, but it gets accomplished. But keep in mind, chelation is for what's in the blood. And there may be damage that has been done uh, in an organ that you can't guarantee that chelation is going to reverse all of that impact. But hopefully you're catching people early enough in that continuum where you can do some good. That's, that's obviously the goal. So what is considered a high level in a child? So it depends what state you live in. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so b this being Vermont, we actually uh, err on the side of being as uh, low a level as possible. So uh, I think many states use 10 and we use 5. Greater than 5? 5 what? I think we're in parts per trillion. <laughs> yeah. Excuse me, if I may interject, yeah. it's, it's micrometers Micro per decimeter. Yeah. Micrograms? Or micrograms per decimeter. Per decimeter. Per decimeter. But it's five. Yes. <laughs> micrograms per decimeter. 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 Yeah. I know that there are a lot of questions. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Uh, so yeah, all the numbers or, that you gave us were um, based on first draw samples? Yes. Uh, how much would those numbers change if we were talking about a flush sample? Uh, I can't tell you that off the top of my head. But did you do flush samples on all those same ones that you did the first draw to, so, to know? For the schools, because that was our protocol, but for the daycares, uh, that often wasn't part of the protocol they've been adhering to for many years. So, um, so you had the numbers for the schools then, yes. but you don't know the model? I don't I know. But I mean, like, was it, a, can you just characterize? The difference between uh, the first I don't want to do that. Sample. I don't want to do that. But I can refer you to the actual report we put out, yeah. which is on our website. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> okay. It would be nice to get that 
um, report onto available to the committee. Mm -hmm. Other questions, we're going to focus on the health-related questions here. We'll get to the water weight-related questions when we get to D.C. But yes, Representative Melvin. Um, has the state undertaken any statewide testing or remediation efforts surrounding paint in public schools? Just given what you were saying about the source of lead being higher from paint, what assurances do we have that there's not a lead paint problem in public schools? Yeah. So whenever a child is diagnosed, uh, we automatically begin a whole protocol that's very home-based because they're each one and two. Um, and don't look at the schools at all. So I don't know what regulations are in place regarding paint, but it has to be something in our schools. Now, again, keep in mind the date of construction is, is pivotal here because um, sure. 1978 is sort of the cutoff for when. Right. I would think most schools in Vermont are older than that. Yeah. I believe there is something, and we can let's bring that yeah. question back to Michael O'Grady because I believe uh, he would likely have that information. Mm -hmm. I know that there's there's some things in terms of painters need to do in terms of sanding, for example, and we don't sell lead paints anymore. Right, they were really concerned about peeling paints, okay. dust from paints, <coughs> and kids of an age who are actually ingesting willful, uh, I as opposed, right, right, as opposed to. Just being in the environment. It's a good concern. Do hold on to that question and let's. And I will ask our environmental health and <coughs> provision if they actually are involved in that. I do know we have a program called Envision, which schools are free to take advantage of, though a lot, some do, a lot don't, uh, which really looks at the environment of the school. So we focus a lot on asthma in that program and environmental precipitants of, of asthmatic attacks, things of that sort. Uh, we look at cleaning products that are used on the floors, waxes, what have you. Uh, I'll have to see if that involves a paint component as well. And I think another thing we might be interested in is something related to uh, the levels in other states, the states that actually do have, have something. You probably have that. <laughs> what I characterized was pretty true. Uh, you know, the majority are 15, and you are at 5, and 1 maybe is 0. I can get you that table if you want. I'm inter interested in our, uh, mainly our contiguous states, and New England sure. neighbors. Other questions for Dr. Levine? I, I know as we go along, there are going to be more questions. Yeah. We really actually start to look at the bill if we haven't done it. Yeah, well, I'm going to stay for some of the other testimonies. Okay. Thank you. Okay, David Englander. So David had to go had to, to go. testify to another committee. Okay. He would ask if you could reverse the order. Or yes, we can, we can do that. Mm -hmm. Which brings us to Brian. DEC. <coughs> You're going to help me with my question that went at some point on how that gets into water. I'll do my best. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, my, for the record, my name is Brian Redman. I'm the director for the Drinking Water and Groundwater Protection Division, which is located within the Agency of Natural Resources. Uh, the agency was a key partner in the 2017 Lead in School Drinking Water Pilot Program. Uh, we had a lead coordination role with the Vermont Department of Health and also um, we're really the experts in the remediation phase of the program that the health department relied on us um, to analyze the data and provide assistance to the schools. Uh, we share the common goal of reducing lead exposure in drinking water. As you heard from the Commissioner of Health, lead is tasteless, odorless, and colorless. And the only way you know if it's in your water supply is to test for it. Uh, the agency is supportive of the statewide testing and uh, remediation program. I offer uh, one specific comment related to a feature on S40, and that has to do with the action level. Uh, it was touched upon by the commissioner, uh, but the EPA action level for lead has been established at 15 parts per billion. Uh, this is the level in which uh, the agency regulates public water systems. 
many of these uh, types of water systems include community water systems, which, which serve, many, many, in many cases, not all cases, serve a school, uh, as well as what's referred to as non-transient, non-community water systems. These are what NTNCs is the acronym for these. Uh, these are a class of public water systems uh, that include approximately 150 of the 450 schools in total. And these are schools that are regulated as a public water system because they have their own well. They are not served by a community water system. Uh, these uh, schools are required to comply with the requirements of, of the federal, federal lead and copper rule. Uh, the EPA uh, first establishes, in terms of es establishing a, a drinking water standard, establishes the goal at the MCLG, the maximum contaminant level goal. Uh, the goal is, is a health-based value at a non-legally enforceable standard, and that is for lead is zero. The action level is established as close as possible to the MCLG while factoring in technical feasibility as well as cost, a cost-benefit analysis. Uh, with respect to cost, and specifically to the school uh, testing, school and child care testing and remediation program, uh, as the standard is lowered, both the scope and the, and the cost of remediation will, will increase. The focus on the remediation so far has been with fixture replacement at an estimated cost of $300 per tap. Uh, the current estimates under the S40 um, do not include uh, an estimate for other types of remediation that may be necessary. Uh, our data is very limited. I was talking with the professor before the testimony. Our data is rather limited on um, what to expect uh, when we get into schools. But uh, one, could, one could say that uh, the cost of remediation and the scope of remediation will likely increase as the standard is lowered with um, the ability for potential for plumbing retrofits, as you heard from um, the business manager previously, or carbon filtration systems as, an, as another option uh, for remediation. Those two types of remediation have not been included uh, in the estimate, estimated cost for the program. They are also very difficult to estimate, as, as Stephanie Barrett will, will tell you. Uh, finally, the division uh, is uh, uh, scheduled and has previously provided a technical assistance to the schools during the remediation phase of a school testing program. Uh, when we estimated, uh, heading into the session, uh, our, our role and what that would take to fulfill that role, uh, we estimated one full-time employee. Uh, that was an estimate that was provided at a standard of 15 parts per billion. Uh, as well as um, just schools, not including the child care facilities. So I just wanted to be clear that that estimate does not include um, the resource. We do not feel that the resources have been allocated necessary to meet the obligations <coughs> under the bill. Let me just see if I could clarify. You said that if it were 15 press pavilion, you would need one FTE? Our, but yes. it already is 15 parts per billion, right? These, this is a new regul this would be a new regulatory okay. program. Um, we do not have any resources currently committed to a school um, lead and drinking water testing program that's contemplated in this bill. We do have a lead and copper rule manager that implements the federal lead and copper rule for all public water systems, and that includes about 150 schools. So um, it's the, the programs are, are different. <coughs> But that would, would include all the schools in the sense that that person is also regulating other municipal systems that are feeding schools, right? So they're directly regulating those 150 schools that have their own wells. <coughs> but they also re regulating the municipalities that supply water to schools that don't have their own wells? Yes, that, that, is, that is a true statement. Under, under the lead and copper rule, the testing that is done in a community water system is uh, we, what they're called tier one sites. Um, their uh, samples are collected within homes of a certain vintage. It's essentially the worst case scenario that we're looking for in let's say an area wide system like Montpelier. Um, we would go collect samples at the worst case sites to diagnose, it's more of the overall corrosivity of the water that's being provided by the municipal water system, where in a program like this, we're actually directing right down to the tap level. Thank you. Other uh, You may not know the answer to this, but I was just uh, what I asked before is, are, do we have any municipal systems whose output of water is above three? Yes. 
And so they presumably serve schools. They do. Yes. So that under this bill, that would require that school, therefore, to put in its own remediation to get that level to three or below. Not necessarily. We've um, spent some time over on the Senate side trying to explain the apples and oranges nature of, of the existing regulation to what's being contemplated now. Um, let's just say Montpelier's, it's a 90th percentile, so 90% 90, 90 of the samples must be below the action level of 15. So that 90th percentile sample, let's say it's five parts per billion, that's the one sample of Montpelier. It does, it's not representative of the lead content coming into the school from the supply. Okay. Is there a difference between um, groundwater, well water, and um, having that, you know, Champlain Water District is Lake Champlain? Mm -hmm. um, is there a difference in terms of the municipal and um, wells, dug well, drilled well? Vast, vast differences. Mm -hmm. um, with respect to lead, I would want to uh, look at the data a little bit closer. I would say, uh, in general, we're not finding um, lead to be a naturally occurring issue in Vermont's groundwater or surface water supplies. It's more of an issue with the piping, the fittings, the fixtures, the solder, and the plumbing components. Uh, if, if I may, uh, one more comment you had asked about funding. Um, there is some funding becoming available through EPA. These, these types of programs are starting to proliferate nationally. Uh, we've rec recently applied um, for funding. Uh, Vermont's allocation would roughly be in the $200,000 range. Um, and for the whole state. For the whole state, and that's specific for testing only. There's no um, advanced notice of, there is other grant programs that are being discussed, but no notice of availability of funding mm -hmm. yet. This is related to this grant money. Um, the Safe Water 3T, is, this, is that what this grant is? The, oh, I see. Uh, the WIIN Act, Section 2107. Yes, the way that's, that's what this is. Yeah. And that's where we get the 200000 from the feds, which is going to cover maybe a quarter of what the, less than a quarter of what the cost would be. Specific to testing, not for remediation. There's yeah. been discussion of additional programs for the remediation side mm -hmm. of the house, but there's been no notice of availability uh, for funding. Representative Elder? Um, so the remediation money, as I understand it, is really for replacement of taps, and um, so I'm just I'm just trying to imagine <coughs> if the testing is happening, and whatever the level is, we establish that certain taps are above that level, and then the remediation is to replace that tap. Is there an opportunity prior to spending the money on replacing a bunch of taps to come to the conclusion that maybe the problem is upstream of the tap? So in other words, if it is a plumbing infrastructure problem, is there a way to figure that out before we replace a bunch of taps that aren't going to solve the issue? Uh, that was one of the reasons that we were advocating for the flush sample collection um, as part of the initial sampling effort. Um, so that, that flush, that first draw sample is going to be your first 250 milliliters of water. That's going to be some volume that's contained in the fixture itself, and then as well as some volume chasing backwards into the plumbing system. So you're going to get some of the copper or plastic tubing, not just the fixture, off that first draw. The 32nd the flush sample is to really try to isolate that column of water further back um, to give us a data point to understand if we may be looking um, beyond the uh, fixture replacement and more into the plumbing. Okay, so that two-part test kind of is seeking to differentiate those numbers. And that's why that we recommended the additional cost be spent up front. That's how we ran our pilot. Um, it was very valuable information, and especially when you're finding lead in, in water. That's good to have more information to be able to, mm -hmm. to, to work quickly. Thank you. Um, I are there new materials? I would imagine since I think some of these are new materials, I don't know, PVC or stainless steel, that even new construction school, new construction school, or if we have to replace um, fittings that we could use, so this would never be an issue again? Um, 
As far as the, the, the latest materials available, I can't really comment on that at this time. I will say that um, in 2010, uh, well, back in 1986, the Safe Drinking Water Act um, promulgated lead-free material requirements. Um, in 2010 in Vermont, that um, allowable amount of lead content in plumbing materials was, was reduced even further. Um, but as we heard on the Senate side, lead-free does not necessarily mean that it's completely lead-free. There is some allowable um, amount of lead content in lead-free products. Anything quickly? Are there other, <clears throat> are there other chemicals uh, that may be put in the water supply system that would affect lead chlorine, for example, um, in a water supply that goes into our schools and our homes. But does that have any effect on the, uh, the parts per million of lead? It could. I don't have specific data to provide you today with respect to that question. I will say that um, all, all schools that are on their own water supplies are required to have the ability um, to disinfect the water. Uh, that's really for the biological control. Mm -hmm. um, so they all do have the capability, the ones that are on their own water supplies um, are, have the capability to add chlorine, not all of them are. Um, and then again on the municipal side, in most instances, instances you're going to have a chlorine residual that's coming in. So it, it could impact corrosivity of the water. Mm -hmm. um, in a municipal water supply context, uh, you're adding corrosion control chemicals to basically coat the insides of the pipes. Um, and that is the really the uh, remediation strategy to control um, to control lead leaching into the into the pipes. So you're <coughs> you're finding in a municipal supply system that there's less lead in those schools than there would be in an outlier um, a town system. Uh, this is a city system. Right. Uh, not a data point I'm prepared to share today, but we have a lot of data under the lead and copper rule. This is all information we collect in our um, data management system. Um, and we could do an analysis to look at the occurrences in um, schools and municipal water supplies uh, versus um, those that are on their own well. Thank you. Is there any correlation between disinfected byproducts and lead? I'm not prepared to answer that at the moment. Okay. Another easy one for the committee. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I'm feeling as we go along, we're going to be, there's going to be more questions. Right? Yeah. Okay, Molly. I don't know if they were going to make it. Um, anybody wants to just raise your hand? Is Molly on here? Is there testimony here? So, for the record, can you tell us who you are? Yeah. Um, I'm Molly Costanza Robinson. I'm a professor of environmental chemistry at Middlebury College. Um, I'm the Middlebury researcher who was referred to earlier, um, who for the past two years has been carrying out the testing within the um, Addison Central School District. Um, and my training, uh, research, and teaching is all surrounding contaminants in the environment and specifically the sampling and detection uh, of low levels of contaminants like lead and drinking water. Um, I appreciate being asked to be here today and, and really appreciate and support the S40 effort. I think it's um, really important. And uh, my first item in my testimony, I, I won't talk through. Um, I think Dr. Levine, Levine did a great job of just laying out why we're so concerned with lead. Um, I'd like to move to point two, which is um, I think why I was asked to be here today, which is to talk a little bit about the sampling methodologies. Um, S40 goes into considerable detail about how to sample, um, and I'm glad for that because sampling for lead is something that it's not hard to do, but it's easy to mess up. And if you don't do the sampling correctly, uh, the general tendency is for those numbers to come out lower than they should be, and therefore not be protective of children's health in the way that it was intended. 
Um, so um, what a good sample is, if you're testing lead, um, is a sample that accurately represents what a child might be exposed to um, who comes into the school first thing in the morning. Um, as Brian talked about, it, the lead is leaching typically from the fixtures or from the pipes, from the solder. Um, and so water that's been sitting overnight, it's, it's, it accumulates that lead. And it's that first pulse in the morning, the first child to get that tap, that's going to be the maximum exposure. Um, and so that's what we look for when, when we're sampling is to take those samples first thing in the morning. Um, I won't go through all of the, the what I already support in S40, except to say that um, I, I do support the methodologies that are in there. Um, all of them uh, comport with what's kind of considered the Bible of lead testing, which is the EPA document, the three T's. Um, this was recently updated um, in ways that um, are really consistent with my experience testing in the schools um, here in Vermont, ways that I think improve the methodology compared to the 2006 um, version of this document. So um, this is what's in the bill currently is, is consistent with this and um, that is supported by the science. Um, but that's the way to go. I'm happy to answer questions about sampling that you may have. Um, but I thought I would move uh, on to the second page and three um, Regarding my supporting what's in here now in terms of the scope of testing, we've heard some, some testimony already that maybe questioned um, which outlets we should be testing. Um, and so I want to support, uh, especially right now, just relative to testimony we heard earlier, um, that all waters, all outlets that have some, a reasonable potential of being used by children for drinking water to be tested. Um, I, when I went first to Edison Central School District, um, the idea was that I should only test drinking water fountains. Um, and I said, I don't think that's enough. People are drinking from others, uh, other, other outlets. Um, and I heard many times that, no, we, we tell them not to drink from the, the bathroom fountains. Um, so, you know, being a researcher, I went to the experts, my, my children, and I said, where are you drinking in the schools? Um, and they said, you know, yeah, we usually drink from, from the bottle fillers. Um, but yeah, yeah, we, we, fill, we fill it up wherever it's convenient. Um, I've had teachers, I, I've posted all my results publicly and shared that with um, teachers. And I've had teachers say, that's my classroom. And I, I guess what I, I kind of knew we weren't supposed to drink from there. But it's often more convenient. Um, so I want to push back against the idea that you can train children, little children, um, in a way that, that's going to be meaningful and effective. Um, as Dr. Levine has, has testified, um, damage from lead can be irreversible. Um, and it it's, goes directly against education. Um, and so to have that um, in schools um, is problematic. Um, so I would, I would recommend and, and push to retain um, what's currently there in terms of the scope of the testing that all water outlets of reasonable potential to be used for consumption of cooking um, be, be included. I agree with earlier testimony um, and my data for ACSD, which I'm happy to share or ask questions, uh, answer questions about. Um, I did, for the superintendent, kind of parse out custodial sinks. I tested them. I tested everything because I want to know. Um, recognizing that some of those, the custodial sinks that are in custodial closets, even if they tested high for lead, I put them as a very low priority for, for remediation. So I think there are, it doesn't have to be 100% of outlets versus only drinking fountains. I think there's a happier middle ground. Um, I excluded uh, those that are less likely to be used for consumption uh, to include showers, custodial sinks that are in closets, um, I think there are, there are some custodial sinks. Uh, for example, um, Mary Hogan Elementary School has a floor sink in their kitchen that's right next to the gym, and it is the most convenient place to fill up a large igloo that would be used by a sports team. Um, so even custodial sinks, I, I, I think even that we have to say, but where are they? And do, they, do students and staff have reasonable access to them? If the answer is no, 
fine for not testing or, or not remediating if you do find something. Um, but I think that should be kept as broad as possible. Um, I also, so moving on to four, um, this would be uh, one of two recommendations for changes to the existing, uh, to the version of the bill that the Senate passed. Um, and that's to lower the action level from three to one. And I'm speaking strictly from a health-based perspective. Um, the only safety-based guidelines for lead um, are the, the MCLG, the Maximum Contaminant Level Goal, um, put forth by the EPA. And again, that's not an enforceable limit, but that's the goal because we know scientifically that there is no safe level of lead exposure. Um, we also know that lead exposure accumulates over time. You, you can remove it from the body slowly, um, but it does accumulate with exposure, and the damage may be irreversible. Um, so because of that, um, that's, that's why the goal is what it is. Um, so therefore, that's my goal. Um, the other safety level that um, has been reported that has been put out um, by the American Academy of Pediatrics, which recommends no higher than one part per billion in schools specifically um, and in outlets that children would drink from. The other guidelines that are out there, including the 15 part per billion EPA action level, that was put forth in 1991. Um, so we have 28 years of things, 28, is that 29? I don't know what we're at, um, where things have changed. Um, so at that time, that was considered a level <coughs> that could be reasonably achieved for municipal water supplies um, and was subjected to their cost benefit analysis. Since then, we know more about low levels of lead and the harm they can do. Um, since then, we've also, um, uh, as Brian referred to, we've lowered <coughs> what can be allowed in the plumbing materials. So lead-free meant one thing in 1986. <coughs> it meant something closer to what you hope it might mean. Uh, in 2010, Vermont passed state law and made that what lead-free meant. They, they lowered that. Federal guidelines came in, um, took effect in 2014, lowering that and, and making lead-free a little bit closer to free of lead. Um, so we're in a new place where we have better materials. Um, the, when the 15 PPB was put into place, um, they were working with existing, existing materials that would now be illegal to sell or illegal to install in a school. Um, so my conclusion, just based on that, is that that is the appropriate health-based goal. There's <coughs> other considerations that your committee has to take into account, of course. Um, next point, uh, in many cases, um, and this is based on the Addison Central data that um, I've collected, the outlets that show high lead are a result of long stagnation times. So the, the lead accumulates in the water overnight, or if a fixture isn't used very often, it may be accumulating for a week or a month if that fixture isn't being used. Um, because of this, um, and the fact that I, I personally am <coughs> rather surprised at how many outlets are in schools. Every classroom has a sink, Every often multiple sinks. Um, and some of these high lead outlets have conveniently located low lead outlets right next to them. Um, and so when we're thinking about costs, I want to put out there the idea that there is a, a good possibility for some of that cost and for some of that remediation to be simply removing outlets from use. Um, of course, you know, you're going to need them in some classrooms and you need them to be convenient for teachers, so that would be something that the staff at the school would have to be involved in. Um, but a conclusion that schools often have a low-cost remedy outlet removal um, available to them is one consideration <coughs> when trying to meet this health-based goal. Um, from my data in ACSD, um, roughly half of all of the, um, cons the outlets that would reasonably be used for consumption um, which includes many outlets that were installed before the new lower lead requirements were put in place. Um, and indeed, some entire schools currently meet the one PPB health-based level. About half of the outlets currently meet it. Um, so I take from that that a one PPB action level is 
technically feasible. It can be done. It's being done in half the outlets, even some of which have that older, higher lead infrastructure. Um, my data show, and this is where Brian said we have we have really limited data to go on, um, but some data show, um, and I'm taking the data there's from the scientific literature as well as from the Department of Health pilot study, um, show that when you do replace fixtures, you do reduce the lead levels. Um, although there's limited data points, we. The, in every case, when the fixture was replaced with a updated per, uh, fixture, the water came down to at or below three parts per billion. Okay. Um, so, and some, you know, three or lower. So some got down to one, would have met a one PEB, um, et cetera. So my conclusion is that schools have a low cost remedy fixture replacement that will suffice to meet the one PEB level much of the time, not all of the time but much of the time. Um, and in cases where fixture replacement is insufficient to meet that one PPV action level, um, I would ask schools to start by revisiting whether the outlet is truly needed, whether it can be removed, um, or whether some of the, the filter uh, remedies would be appropriate, a, a point of use um, treatment technology. Um, ACSD has installed some of these filters, they put in bottle filling stations in many of the schools. They obtained a grant, um, I think, from the Solid Waste District to do some of those replacements. I can, de I can detect down to 0.1 parts per billion lead. I cannot detect lead that comes out of those bottle filling stations that have the filters in, in, included in them. Um, so they are an effective technology. I would only caution, they're, they're effective and they will easily meet a one part per billion level. Um, I would caution though that filters need maintenance. Um, they need to be replaced. If the outlet is not used frequently, you run the risk of having bacteria build up and, and other concerns. So you may be trading one water quality concern for others. Um, and so um, if schools are going to be using a filter to achieve a, a safety level, they need to to put in place a, a maintenance um, So that's kind of my, my rationale um, for recommending a one PPB um, health-based goal. Um, my final recommendation that I wanted to bring to the committee is um, a, a recommendation for grandfathering in schools that have already completed testing um, for the initial round um, of testing to grandfathering schools that have read it already recently tested using the methodology that S40 puts for it um, because it is more protective, it's, it's better sampling methodology um, than what might be done elsewhere. And I'll just give a very quick example about sampling methodology. Um, the New York City schools <laughs> tested all of their, their schools um, and they were pleased with the results and they reported that um, only a third of the, only a third of their schools had elevated levels of lead, which they defined as outlets greater than 15, the, the EPA action level. Um, when the New York Times pushed them on their methodology, they found out they were not using 3T's methodology. They were, in fact, flushing the pipes for two hours the night before they sampled. That serves to remove all of that water to scour any particulate. Um, and to kind of bring fresh water into the school and kind of reduce those stagnation times. When they repeated the testing, um, it went from 30% to 33% of schools up to 85% of schools that had elevated levels. One school, the drinking water, uh, in water fountains, the highest level was 35 before with faulty method, and it was 3,500 <coughs> with appropriate methods. Um, they had to redo tens of millions of dollars worth of, of sampling and testing because they had they had done it wrong. Um, so I do want to emphasize, I, I, I support grandfathering it in. A lot of schools have been very proactive about doing this and doing this properly. Um, and if they can show that they've done it properly, I see no reason why that existing sampling shouldn't be carried forward and be considered compliant. Um, so I think if I added it up correctly, Dr. Levine has said that at least 47 schools have have done so, um, either through the BDH pilot, my own pilot, and ACSD, and then other schools. Um, 
I've given some just specific recommended, recommended changes to language that comports with what I've just said. Um, I don't think there's anything new there, though, so I'll stop there. Questions? I just have one. Yes, just real quickly. Would it make sense to just, until we figure this out, to like inform schools? Maybe not. I'm not sure, but just as a practice to flush the water ahead of time. I mean, just to kind of prevent that buildup. Right. And, but I know that might might not be a great idea. But I'm um, just wondering. If I that mean, would in, in make sense. my data, when we do the flush samples, it's it's had good results. Um, I have. Uh, I have some number, if I can find them. Um, when we flushed, the number of outlets that were above one PVB, if they, there was 51% that failed, the one PVB on the first draw. After flushing, only 7% did. So most samples would be aided by flushing, most outlets. Um, the literature suggests that there's some concern with flushing because what flushing can do is to mobilize particles um, that have kind of they're stuck on the inside of the pipe, and as you flush, you can actually release particles. Um, and if someone's drinking them, those particles they can dissolve, and the lead would dissolve out of them in the stomach acid and make that bioavailable. Um, so it's it is used, it's effective much of the time. It's hard to guarantee that it's being effective. It would require testing to, to know mm -hmm. how it's operating in that system. Do we have any animal samples on um, in the consumption of, of water at certain levels? Or? I don't know about those studies. That's not my Are you area. aware of studies, animal studies? This might be a little bit harder to test some of the cognitive functioning of <laughs> they're trying to correlate what they're ingesting with what yeah. shows up in there. Yeah. What do you paint, gas, or water? I have a feeling there's literature on there. I have a challenge I think that's facing our committee. Mm -hmm. We are a group of citizen legislators, and we're supposed to come up with a number. Could be 15, yeah, there's a reason to choose that. Could be three, that's what the Senate said in their infinite wisdom. And then there's one, and then there's zero. And some of us like to have a little bit more sense of, you know, a, a data-based, research-based reasons for selecting a number. And I'm personally just feeling uncomfortable with that as being something that this really nice group of people is going to come up with based on something that I can't, I can't grab what it is I'm basing it on. Mm -hmm. <coughs> for my, I mean. The scientific evidence is that no level of lead is safe. So as low as possible is going to be most health protective. Um, I, I, I mean, you can't argue with that. But then yeah. there's the other side, which is there's other concerns. There is there's financial concerns, um, for example. And what I think is is fair to say is that the lower you can possibly go, the the better it's it's going to be. Um, anything is going to be better than what is happening now, <laughs> because there are there are high levels in some outlets in some schools. Um, the risk to children is directly related to that concentration and to the volume of water that they're ingesting. Um, going to the health equity standpoint, it's it's also true or known that children absorb more a larger fraction of lead that they ingest, and they do so more. So when there's already a nutritional deficit, essentially their body is trying to grab onto whatever it can get. So if the child is low in calcium or low in iron, they're grabbing onto more um, and they're absorbing more of that lead. Um, so this is adding insult to injury for, for children who are already ex at, at risk for others. But in terms of looking at that, in terms of risk, there's no way to attach you know, at three, the risk is this. At one, the risk is this. From the discussion today, 15 sounds pretty high in the discussion that we're hearing. Sounds pretty high. 15 sounds high to me because I know we can get lower 
easily. One is a health-based goal, and I also, <coughs> three would be better, way better than 15. I mean, it's, yeah. you know, I mean I'm, I'm in the same boat with you. I'm not really adding to the discussion, I think. But, but we don't necessarily have um, a cost related to going from one to three, but anyway, definitely. I mean, we, we do have some, I mean, I can, <laughs> if folks are interested, I can give some percentages yeah. of ACSD if it is representative of something larger, which um, it does span the age range of schools. I think that is typical in Vermont. It spans size range from very small elementary schools to a larger high school. 5% um, of first draw samples failed the 15. 25 would fail at three, and 51 fail at one. 25 at three? At three. And how many? At one, fifty-one percent failed. So it it gives you some idea of cost. Um, almost all of those pass on the flush. I, I don't anticipate a lot of retrofitting of pipes. Um, I anticipate a lot of changing of fixtures. You say pass pass at three or pass at one or sorry? Well you say on flush, most of those pass. Correct. At what level? Um, at 15, they all pass okay. in ACSD. At three, two percent failed, so 98 okay. passed. And at one, 93 percent passed. Excuse me. If, if the, and this probably isn't for you, but probably better for when Brittany was here. To get from three to one, how much more expensive would that be? Hmm. That's the big question. It's almost it's doubling the number of outlets that are now in play. Yeah. So going from 25% of the consum consumption-based outlets up to 51%. And your methodology when you were doing first draws, I recollect, you did it during school break? No. It was, was it just an eight-hour wait? Yes. Okay. All of our sampling was done on a Saturday morning after a oh, okay. typical Friday day of school, Jane. which is consistent. That's what the 3Ts would recommend. Consistent things? Yeah, um, I'll try to <coughs> word this coherently, but I don't know if I'll succeed. So if um, if a child is diagnosed with lead exposure or lead poisoning, and it can be proven that that source of lead traced to the water in the school, is that a can, can precise, can you trace that off and back? Like, yes, this definitely came from the school, or is it just impossible to ever prove where it came from? And to further continue my question, then what becomes the liability of the school district if you say, yeah, we picked three, because <laughs> it was kind of lower than bottled water, but uh, it wasn't quite one. Like, is, is, do you get where I'm going with this? I, I understand your question. I'm gonna yeah. shunt to Dr. Levine. <laughs> That's a real challenge. Um, keep in mind, the majority of children are younger than school-age children who are getting diagnosed. Hmm. And it's more related to the home environment to, and the school environment. Um, but there is nothing that would trace lead to a paint versus a water source. So I mean, it's just meant that you're measuring in the water. So you wouldn't be able to actually figure that out. Would it be fair to say that if a young child was at a child care center that tested at one and had lead poisoning? that the child care center would not be the first place you'd go look to find the source. But what if, and what if they were at three, the random three? It would still be very nice. Okay. So you know, there's a, since I'm talking. Go ahead. No, <laughs> we, we, we like then, hearing from you. We, we need to not make, the, I guess the expression is the perfect, the enemy of the good. Um, we're still, doing something revolutionary in Vermont by even addressing this issue compared to a huge majority of states that are not. We do have a dearth of, we'll call it, guideline setting organizations uh, that actually are weighing in in a way that the American Academy of Pediatrics weighed in. Um, the EPA knows they're overdue with re-examining and publishing this, um, but still no traction there yet. 
but we know they haven't been ordered, but they're certainly not really going to allow them to say they're changing the level. Um, so, so you don't have a lot, of, you and we don't have a lot uh, to look towards and sort of saying um, this is really what we should be striving to achieve because there's consensus <coughs> in the field from expert panels, etc., that this should be the guideline. Uh, so um, I, I'm agreeing that to be ultimately and totally health protective, there shouldn't be any. Or there should be as little as is detectable, um, but at the same time, we have to be pragmatic and go with feasibility, go with existing rules that you've heard about uh, that already talk about what, what level is going into the school, uh, never mind what's coming out of the faucet. Uh, so, so there's a lot of factors and we appreciate that. We know we will be benefiting Vermont kids by addressing the issue at all, because there's still plenty that are above 15, that magic number um, that probably isn't relevant anymore in, in modern times, now that we know so much more about that. But at the same time, we know we're going to be doing a lot of benefit uh, as we go lower and lower and lower, but certainly just addressing the issue at all. Child care facility, licensed child care facilities now, home environments as well as, as, as centers, are required to do some water testing, correct? I mean, yes. for coliform or some such thing. And they're required and for yes. lead. Yeah. Yes. They are required right. currently not, already. Not adhering to the protocols that we've described. Right. But, but still. So they, they are required to test for lead, and they're required to do that how often? Just once and we're done? Uh, I'm not sure. I don't know the answer. I, I just mm -hmm. didn't know, Sarah. So, yeah. I know yeah. the answer yeah. to that question. <laughs> You know. <laughs> I, I was going to recommend that you talk with DCF. I know there yeah. is some ongoing monitoring that um, is required once. But maybe as far as I understand <laughs> it, for, for the, the record, record, name, for the record, Elena Mahali at CLF, yeah. the Regional Law Foundation. As far as I understand the regulation, it requires testing once every six years, which is when the licensing happens, unless you get a positive test, in which case you are required to retest. So if you yeah. if you get a clean sample, which their action level is 15 parts per billion, then you would get to go for six years without another sample. There's also no notification requirement in the child care. No notification to, to parents, to, parents. to guardians. And they're held at 15? Yes. And we're not following the protocol? It is Correct. a separate protocol. Larger samples. If I, the big thing is that it's a one liter sample rather than a 250 milliliter sample. Um, and because fixtures are primarily the problem and the, primarily the source of lead, it's expected that that first pulse of water that exits is the high lead pulse, and that by continuing with a larger sample size, you're effectively diluting it. So it's both 15, a high, stand, or a high action level, and it's with a diluted sample that's inherently lower. So it's, I'm just curious. It sounds like you're more concerned with the lead in the paint. Are the child care centers required to test that, the lead level? Yeah, that's okay. Oh, okay. We're going to get back to it. Okay. Yeah. I, I did want to also say that, and I don't remember exactly the final wording from the Senate bill how this looked, but certainly we all advocated for that this would not be a one time testing and this would recur again in the future. And the uh, original number that was chosen was a five-year number. Um, that does allow that as science evolves, if you will, and as guidelines evolve, that adjustments can be made. Um, there could also be something within the five-year period if science evolves without even retesting um, to allow uh, discretion, if you will, to change in whatever level is set. I don't, say this to give you the opportunity to punt, you know, and <laughs> so now we'll just do this and see what happens in the future, but at the same time, it's an evolving science, um, and it's an evolving set of guideline settings. Um, so all the states that have done what they've done have either just chosen to go with EPA or chosen to do something as low as they could go, um, but they weren't doing it based on a specific mandate from an organization that said this is the way it should be. Um, 
Can homeowners test, or would they get a test kit to test their own water? They would just, uh, the Department of Health lab. There are probably labs in your community, right, that you need to certify, right? You silly person. The, <laughs> no, okay. the Department of Health Lab is the easiest I mean, someone has to test. <laughs> someone has to do the St. John's very, I don't know. Yeah, there, there's a number of certified labs that we do. It all goes to the state lab. Yeah. And as I remember, mm -hmm. and, and or Paul certified does it? Or Paul Burns might remember several years ago, we did pass a bill that at the time of a sale of a home, you had to present somebody with a list of testing from the... We were trying to put in that you had to test for these at the sale, but um, we ended up saying something that at the you have to present the uh, recommended water tests um, to be done before before sale. Well I'm water. sure you well do that water. Time, right? well with well water. Well water. Get out the back end. Yeah. Yeah. For the record, Brian Redmond, I would just add that there are new testing requirements yeah. for uh, new newly drilled wells that do include lead. Um, let's go up in effect July 1 of this year. Um, that's a range of constituents, but it does include lead. But that's only for new wells that are being drilled. Yeah. And is it actually the well that tends to be the problem, or is it really more the fixtures anyway? The, the sample will be coming from inside the home, but. Yeah. Are there questions? <laughs> so, who else do we need to hear from? Who do we need to hear from? Dupont. Madam Chair. Nope. Yeah. Dupont. Madam Chair. I asked David to come back upstairs, but clearly he's still busy, so. Okay. We need to hear from the Well, we need, yeah, we need, we, we need to hear from AOA, that's for sure. We need to hear from Stephanie. Regarding the money, um, I'm scheduled. I'm scheduled yeah. Okay. Yeah. Otherwise known as the bees. <laughs> what are you thinking? Yeah. I, I'm just, you know, I'm still trying to wrap my head around uh, not so much the science of whether or not we should or shouldn't test and mitigate, but the method by which we fund these types of improvements. It seems to me that as the Education Committee, our primary responsibility is to understand how we do these things, not what we do. That's the expertise of other committees in the building and other areas of policy, uh, such as the Health Department and others. We don't understand that. So for me, I just want to understand what our responsibilities are within the education fund, within uh, capacity for state, age for state aid for construction and things like that, because that to me is a broader policy question that this committee oversees, recognizing that we have a lot to work on with this. I, I would be inclined to think that funding for this is not coming from the end fund. I was thinking it's coming from something else. Possibly our friends know. next door. <laughs> well, depending yeah. on how much state funding there is. <coughs> yeah. Because what the state doesn't fund does come right out of the FR. Well, and it does. I mean, there is a policy question of when, if we set policy about parts per billion that does, in fact, incur more expenses than what we appropriate, either in a budget adjustment vehicle, a capital f bill, or a budget bill, mm -hmm. then there is a period where we have to true up. And so for me, it is more of a question of what is the sustainable resource allocation for this type of work if we believe that the health of our kids is valuable. And that's that's a bigger question about education policy, and I've just been interested to hear from education stakeholders about that. So I do know that um, the Chair of Human Services has request, requested to at some point have possession of this bill mm -hmm. um, because she they're involved with the licensing of child care facilities. There is a question you're almost raising as to whether this should go up to health but I, I'm kind of thinking we might be able to handle that without them. Mm. Um, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> Representative Kupali appears to be done. Right? <laughs> 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 um, is there yeah. anybody um, else that wants to, if, if, if you, if, um, I don't know if, if um, Bikberg wants to speak on this at some point, not right now. But um, schedule with, with Shannon. We've already got CLF is ready to, to testify. Um, so I've got 
AOE, we've got the V's, we've got our ledge council, we have Stephanie, and I'm just... Madam Chair? Yes. Who's Stephanie? She's the uh, Joint Fiscal. Oh, good. Yeah. Oh. And there is, because the request from, that I think we got fairly clearly um, from the Senator, my Senator, um, that they have this tied to the budget adjustment um, <laughs> bill that is on the floor tomorrow, and we have, as you as you may have heard today, oh, that yes, they stripped <laughs> that from the Budget Adjustment Act. Meanwhile, we have the budget coming right behind it. Um, it does feel that we, we still, regardless, still have some pressure to get this moved. And I'm just checking, are people um, interested in continuing to move forward with this bill? Is there anybody that thinks that we should not? I feel better about my state just seeing that. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so in terms of tomorrow, tomorrow we have our at 9 o'clock the Regional Educational Television Network would like to come see with us. We're going to do something on budget, I think, at 9.15. Was it budget at 9.15? Uh, well, if, if, there's, if time allows, we'll who, talk who was going to speak? Oh, that, that's right here. No. We have Susan Staley starting at 9.15. 9.15. Yeah. They're coming at 9.15. Okay, great. Right. AOE is to follow. And then AOE is to follow. On, on the committee bill, and then we go to our... And then we're going and tomorrow we're doing our... Um, our what is it? Oversight, oversight of the Agency of Education. Of education. That's going to be happening in the well of the, the house. That was the only room that we could get. That's a joint uh, committee meeting. That's going to be happening tomorrow. That's the house. That was the only room that we could get. That's a joint meeting with GovOps. Um, and then after floor, we pick this bill up again. We have a, a brief thing on um, from Disability Awareness Day, and then we pick up this bill again. We have um, uh, our ledge council will actually be going through the bill with us, and then we also have Conservation Law Foundation. I'm going to try to see if we can build more into that at this point. I don't know. Are you scheduled yet? Friday. You're scheduled Friday. Okay. I want to get as much done as we can on this bill mm -hmm. this week. Okay. Thank you.